Good morning, folks. Uh, Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission will come to order. I keep forgetting I have this gavel thing here, which is sort of strange, knocking it in my own office by myself. Uh, welcome, everyone, to um, the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission rulemaking on mission change. We're allowing folks to enter the room at this point. Um, in another 30 seconds or so, we will start off with the roll call. All right, hearings officer Larson, it looks like we steadied out at about 60 participants. If you wanna go ahead and call the roll, that would be great. Certainly. <clears throat> Commissioner Bogue. Here. Commissioner Gonzalez. Here. Commissioner McGowan. Here. Commissioner Mesner. Here. Commissioner Nanjapa. Here. Commissioner Putnam. Commissioner Robbins. Here. Mr. Chair, you have six out of seven commissioners present. Thank you, that is a quorum and allows us to do business. Um, we will move into our agenda. Um, hearings Officer Larson, do you want to um, speak to the full hearing agenda schedule that was posted over the weekend? Certainly, I'd be happy to. So uh, this weekend we posted a revised agenda for this week for the rulemaking and stakeholders and parties will note that we added a day Monday, September the 14th for one additional day of hearing. Um, we wanted to build that in, in case we need that for further commissioner deliberations. And so stakeholders and parties could um, have that on their calendars should we need to go to Monday. Um, other than that, the agenda has been revised to reflect the times that remain for parties to provide presentations on the 600 and 200 series rules. And other than that, um, I think the, the agenda is fairly straightforward. Great, thank you. The first item on our agenda is the consent agenda. Is that right, Ms. Larson? It is. Okay, have commissioners, um, do we have a discussion or do we have a motion to approve consent agenda? Mr. Chair, I'll motion to approve the uh, consent agenda for uh, the pooling for our data resources. Second. Can we have a second from Commissioner Nanjapa? Do we have any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing none, consent agenda is approved. Off to a rip roaring start. Okay, we now move to the mission change rulemaking 200 to 600 series. Uh, we are continuing with party presentations on the 600 series. Ms. Larson, if you would bring the next stakeholder group to the house, we will get them ready for a 30 minute and 42 second presentation. Be happy to. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Freeman. Um, looks like we have you, uh, Mr. Delahanty. Are there others that will be presenting this morning? There are, there should be three others. Um, Leanne Hill, Carol Kwiatkowski and Susan Spees. Okay, Ms. Larson will start finding them. Okay, when Ms. Kwiatkowski is on, there we go, great, all right. Um, I think all five of us are, are on, so I, we're ready to start whenever you are. Uh, we are ready. Um, Ms. Larson will be keeping track of time. 
Uh, we look forward to your presentation. Uh, thank you for appearing Tuesday morning um, with us on September 8th. Before I, before I begin, uh, uh, Ms. Larson, we were hoping to share our screen and I'm getting a message saying that the screen sharing has been disabled. One moment and we will make sure that's an option. Give us a second here. There you go, it should be ready to go. Great, thank you. All right. Okay, we are uh, ready if you are. The floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Michael Freeman again, and we'll be appearing on, I'm appearing on behalf of the environmental groups. We'll focus today on rule 604 and the proposed setback uh, rules. First, I'd like to thank the commission and staff and all the stakeholders for the attention and focus you've given to this important issue. We'll have three witnesses this morning. First, Leanne Hill and Carol Kwiatkowski will discuss the scientific literature regarding public health and other impacts from oil and gas development. Our third witness, Susan Spies, will add some more testimony regarding air emissions and complaints from residents in Broomfield. And then I'll briefly address some of the data showing how operators may be affected by larger setbacks. And we'd like to also reserve five minutes for closing remarks. So before I turn it over to our witnesses, I would like to summarize our requested changes on the setback requirements. First, we ask that the setback be increased to 2,500 feet and that it apply both to schools and to all residential building units. We believe the same setback should apply both to homes and to schools. The kids at those schools go home every day and the nuisances and health risks apply just as much to, to residences as they do for schools. We're also asking the commission to drop the distinction between the number of homes when setting the setback. As other uh, witnesses have said, drawing the line to protect larger numbers of homes is inappropriate because it would leave rural communities and smaller residential areas unprotected. Second, we've asked that no variances be allowed from setbacks, but at a minimum, the commission requir should require a variance under rule 502 for any deviations from the setback distances and set a strict standard under rule 502. For any setback to be effective, there needs to be a high bar before any departure from that setback is allowed. Third, with regard to the interplay between alternative location analyses and setbacks, we ask that the ALA trigger be set at a greater distance than the setback. The ALA and the setbacks, they serve different purposes. The setback is supposed to draw a line where locations are just not permitted. On the other hand, ALAs cover areas where the commission isn't precluding drilling, but wants additional review and analysis of potential sites. So the two requirements should cover different zones and not be totally coextensive. We'll be happy to address questions about these topics at the end of our remarks, but First, I'll turn it over to Ms. To Ms. Hill, and I will stop sharing my screen. Great, thank you, Mr. Freeman. Just give me one moment. There we go. Excellent. Uh, commissioners, it's uh, it's an honor to appear before you today. I hope you all had a had a wonderful long weekend. Uh, my name is Leanne Hill. I'm a senior scientist at the Energy Science and Policy Research Institute, uh, Physician Scientists and Engineers for Healthy Energy, or PSE for short. PSE is a multidisciplinary, nonpartisan, and nonprofit research institute dedicated to supplying evidence-based scientific and technical information on the public health, environmental equity, and climate dimensions of energy production and use. In my role at PSE, I conduct research on the environmental and public health dimensions of oil and gas development in the United States. Before I get started here, I want to verify that my screen sharing is, is working and folks can see my slides. We can. Thank you, Ms. Hill. Excellent. A decade ago, when oil and gas development began to rapidly increase across many states, there was a dearth of peer-reviewed evidence to evaluate the potential for health risks associated with these activities. Within this past decade, an expansive body of peer-reviewed literature has been published examining the health risks associated with residential proximity to oil and gas development. 
My testimony today is based on a review of the studies published to date, indicating that there are health hazards, risks, and potential impacts to communities that live, work, play, and learn in close proximity to and among high density of oil and gas development. Table one in my written testimony provides a summary of these peer-reviewed study findings. As shown on this slide, my review covered three main types of studies. Risk assessment studies incorporating air monitoring and dispersion modeling conducted in Colorado, studies examining noise exposures, and epidemiological studies conducted in Colorado and other states. Recent air monitoring and dispersion modeling studies conducted in Colorado demonstrate the proximity to oil and gas development is associated with increased health risks, largely driven by exposure to benzene and other volatile organic compounds that are naturally occurring in petroleum-based sources. Within and at 500 feet, the peer-reviewed studies in Colorado suggest increased acute non-cancer health risks, increased cancer risks, and elevated noise at levels that cause annoyance and sleep disturbance and may be detrimental to health. Numerous oil and gas-associated hazardous air pollutants have also been detected in Colorado at distances beyond 500 feet from the well pad, out to distances of approximately a mile. The recent CDPHE 2019 risk assessment found potential for non-cancer adverse health effects associated with acute exposures to numerous air pollutants among the highest exposed individuals. Of note, elevated health risks associated with exposure to benzene persisted out to 2,000 feet. While some studies indicate that air concentrations of certain pollutants detected at further distances from a well pad may be below certain health gu guidance values, it's important to note that exposure to low concentrations of oil and gas associated chemical pollutants can impact the endocrine system, particularly during critical periods of development, which can influence numerous adverse health outcomes. On this side, you can see the 22 epidemiological studies included in my review that evaluate proximity to and density of oil and gas development and various health risks. With the vast majority of studies, 20 of the 22, reporting at least one statistically significant health finding. Four of the peer-reviewed studies conducted in Colorado evaluate proximity to wells and nearby well density, considering distances out to 10 miles. These studies have found that proximity to and density of nearby oil and gas development in Colorado is associated with increased odds of developing birth defects among newborns, increased odds of developing acute lymphocytic leukemia among young individuals, and increased indications of cardiovascular disease. 18 peer-reviewed studies have been conducted outside of Colorado in California, Oklahoma, Pennsylvania, and Texas. These studies also evaluate distances out to 10 miles and have found that proximity to and density of oil and gas development is associated with adverse perinatal or birth outcomes, asthma, hospitalizations, migraines, and other negative health impacts. These epidemiological studies are used to investigate the potential for relationships or associations between exposures and health outcomes. As Dr. Richardson commented last week, it took decades of research to establish causality between cigarette smoking and health harm. While the literature regarding residential proximity to oil and gas development is newer than that of smoking, the decade of research thus far points in the same direction, indicating that proximity to oil and gas development is a risk factor associated with a range of adverse health outcomes. Last week, certain parties offered their perspective on the limitations of the <laughs> epidemiological literature developed over the past decade. However, I want to stress that this body of literature also has many strengths inherent to the methods used and the variables considered. First, these studies use complex proximity-based exposure metrics that consider distance from the well pad and nearby well density. Additionally, studies conducted more recently have also um, considered the activity phase at the well pad and well-specific oil and gas production. These metrics inherently take into account cumulative exposures associated with oil and gas development, including chemical stressors such as air pollution and non-chemical stressors such as noise and light pollution. These studies are therefore particularly relevant in informing broader setback policy, but perhaps are less relevant for informing mitigation policies specific to air pollution and noise. If time today allows, I can further address critiques of these metrics that were presented last week. Second, the researchers use different strategies to narrow the focus of their investigation to the exposure and health outcome of concern. These strategies include adjusting statistical models to consider potential confounding variables as shown in the boxes on this slide, or restricting the geographic study area to limit influence of other pollution sources. The majority of these studies control for a variety of these health relevant factors and still found associations between proximity to oil and gas development and adverse health outcomes. In sum, while each of these studies has strengths and limitations, and the study methodologies have changed and become more sophisticated over time, the body of literature points in the same direction, indicating a positive association between proximity to oil and gas development and public health risks considering what 
distances well beyond 500 feet. Additionally, a recent report by the CTEH LLC and presented last week by Dr. Tammy McMullen includes a very limited evaluation of health risks as compared to other recent air quality risk assessment efforts. First, the CTEH report only considers exposure to a single compound, benzene, while the reality of oil and gas development and production includes emissions of various health damaging air pollutants. While benzene was the primary compound of focus, Dr. McMullen did not discuss benzene as a known human carcinogen and potential for cancer risk in the data she presented. Second, the report only includes evaluations of acute exposures spanning one to 14 days. And while acute exposures are relevant to assess, it's also important to evaluate chronic exposures given the various stages of development that may be occurring simultaneously near human populations and considering the long duration of the production phase of a well. And finally, the risk assessment studies that uh, the recent re risk assessment studies are peer reviewed, which is a fundamental step to ensure the data are presented and interpreted in an accurate manner. To my knowledge, the recent data presented by Dr. Tammy McMullen include, including surprising claims of no benzene detections and limited detections of total volatile organic compounds have not yet been peer reviewed with the same kind of academic rigor as other recent studies. Based on available peer reviewed science, proximity to oil and gas development is associated with a range of health hazards, risks, and impacts. The growing body of epidemiological literature, bolstered by recent risk assessment studies in Colorado, demonstrate that the existing setback distance requirements are woefully inadequate to protect public health. Furthermore, from a public health perspective and in alignment with the precautionary principle, remaining uncertainty should not be equated with an absence of health risks. As such, setbacks from oil and gas development should be based on peer-reviewed science and incorporate a substantial margin of safety. Therefore, I recommend a more uniform and protective setback distance of at least 2,000 feet be implemented across all sites where populations live, work, play, and learn. This aligns with the currently proposed setback of 2,000 feet from schools and childcare centers. While children may spend approximately a third of their time at school or at a childcare center, they spend far more time in and around their homes. In alignment with the SB 181 mandate for regulations that protect public health, safety, and welfare, Rule 604 should protect all Coloradans regardless of their type of residential housing and should include protections for children and other sensitive subpopulations where they live, work, play, and learn. Thank you for your time and I'm going to switch things over here to share with Dr. Kwiatkowski. Good morning. Get my Good morning. Going. Are you sharing your screen as well? Yes, I am. It looks like I'm able to do that. Yes, we see your screen now. Okay, perfect. I'm Carol Kwiatkowski. The work I've conducted relevant to this testimony was done while I was the director of the Endocrine Disruption Exchange, a science-based Colorado nonprofit known as TEDx. TEDx's mission was to reduce the exposure to harmful environmental chemicals, particularly those that have impacts during human development. 17 years ago, a woman named Laura Amos, a resident of Garfield County, approached TEDx's founder with a curious question. She wondered if the four wells that were fracked a thousand feet from her home and the subsequent blowout of her water well could have caused the rare adrenal tumor she had acquired. She was particularly concerned because at the time she was pregnant that launched TEDx's involvement in the relationship between human health and unconventional oil and gas operations, which I'll refer to as UOG. I'm grateful for the opportunity to share with you what I know, particularly with regards to adverse effects during prenatal and early childhood development that arise from exposure to very low concentrations of chemicals. I personally have spent 13 years reviewing the peer-reviewed literature on UOG and adverse health outcomes. My conclusion is that setbacks should be at least 2,500 feet from human dwellings, and here's why. <clears throat> Many well-conducted epidemiological studies, including from Colorado, have shown adverse birth outcomes at 2,500 feet and beyond. These include low birth weight, preterm birth, and being born small for gestational age. It is well established by the medical community that babies born too early or too small are at increased risk of chronic health conditions throughout their lifetimes. Importantly, the effects found in these and other studies are supported by laboratory studies of UOG exposures conducted in mice, rats, fish, frogs, and cells. The outcomes were consistent with the human studies and occurred at very low exposure concentrations. 
It's also important to mention that human studies conducted in Colorado have continued to find adverse health effects, despite industry claims that VOC concentrations are now at safe levels. Next, I'd like to talk about risk assessments. You know that the extremely thorough risk assessment published last year by CDPHE found adverse health effects at 2,000 feet, the furthest distance studied. That was a very important finding. But no matter how thorough, risk assessments don't measure everything. I'd like to call your attention to some of the things we are missing when we rely on risk assessments. This big yellow outer circle depicts the universe of all possible UOG air pollutants. The estimates of the number of chemicals are from frac focus, which lists over a thousand fracking chemicals of which we estimate at least a third are likely to be volatile. And from a review we published on all the UOG air monitoring studies done to date. It's a conservative estimate because it doesn't include chemicals used in drilling and other practices that aren't reported to frac focus or measured in the air. The smaller light green circle represents the subset of chemicals that are typically measured in air monitoring studies and that were evaluated in CDPHE's 2019 risk assessment and the McMullen paper. It is roughly 50 chemicals. So you can see that we are not capturing all possible chemical exposures by a long shot. We're also not capturing all possible health outcomes. This very small dark orange circle represents the six chemicals CDPHE assessed that had health criteria values based on developmental or endocrine effects. Our research indicates at least 12 of the pollutants measured in this study can impact hormone function or hormone mediated outcomes. For example, benzene was not included among the six chemicals identified as having developmental effects. Not only has research shown benzene to be associated with adverse birth outcomes, but the effects occur at exposure concentrations below health criteria values. How could this be true? Health criteria values, or safe levels of exposure, are set by assessing effects at relatively high doses, then making assumptions that if the dose were 100 or even 1,000 times less, it would be safe. Here's the catch. They don't actually test for effects at the safe levels. If they did and they assessed developmental outcomes, they would likely find that many so-called safe levels are not protective during development when chemicals like benzene transfer easily through the placenta. For some chemicals, effects occur in parts per trillion concentrations, a dose range at which hormones function. So this explains how air monitoring can show very low concentrations of harmful chemicals, and you still see significant effects in epidemiological studies of prenatal exposures. Now, although I'm using a familiar example of benzene, I wanna emphasize that we do not know that benzene is the main driver of public health risk, as has been said. Benzene is a known carcinogen. It's been studied for decades. So like the other chemicals in the tiny circle, we know a lot about it. And health criteria values have been created for risk assessments. But it's not logical to assume that if the known, well-known chemicals in these small circles are safe, then the hundreds of chemicals in the big circle, those that we know little to nothing about, are also safe. Unfortunately, we can't study all the chemicals used in UOG. There are too many, we probably don't have analytical methods for all of them, and some are protected as confidential business information. That's why setbacks are so important. To protect people from the uncertainty around everything in the big circle and beyond, which includes non-chemical stressors that others have described. Based on my own research and that of dozens of scientists around the country, it is clear that UOG is associated with significant health effects particularly adverse birth outcomes following prenatal exposure. It's also clear that such adverse effects occur well beyond current setback distances as far away as 2,500 feet. We cannot assume that regulations such as emission controls will solve the problem. We've already waited nearly two decades, an entire generation, for the science to catch up with what Laura Amos and her daughter experienced. In my opinion, this research supports a setback of at least 2,500 feet and it should apply across the board to schools and residences regardless of population density. Kids spend much more time at home than they do at school. It's time to protect the next generation of Coloradans. Thank you. With that, I will stop sharing and can go to Dr. Spies. Thank you, Dr. Krakowski. And I'm gonna share my screen with some slides for Dr. Spies. And we can see your screen, Mr. Freeman. Great. Um, 
Dr. Spies. Thank you, Mike. And good morning to the commissioners. Thank you for allowing me to be with you again this morning. <clears throat> I want to speak with you today, not as a community association representative, but as a scientist and as an impacted citizen. After moving into my forever home, I learned that there would be an industrial level oil and gas pad going uh, 1,260 feet behind my home. As a, a college professor, I had taught about oil and gas processes in my environmental studies courses, and I had worked with the leadership in Pennsylvania when dealing with the Marsalis Shale <clears throat> back in the early 2000s. I knew that Colorado would not allow us to stop the process, but I was determined to do as much as possible to um, provide the best, safest, greenest uh, protocols as is possible. In Broomfield, we were very proactive on this process and we required closed loop systems, pipelines to be in place before the completion of drilling, tankless sites, no flaring, and we analyzed hundreds of accidents at oil and gas sites and considered the radius uh, of the impact of those accidents in order to develop our setback recommendations. Looking at all of the accidents uh, that we had been able to assess, the minim minimum radius was around 2,400 feet. But because of state rules, we cut it down to a quarter of a mile. As I mentioned in my previous conversations with you, I had collected air samples and tried to determine what was causing the negative health impacts. It was more than just collecting air samples, was looking at wind velocities and directions, temperatures, barometric pressure, et cetera. In other words, as a scientist, I wanted to eliminate all variables that I could to tighten up the relationship between symptoms being reported and oil and gas activities. I and other residents were being exposed 24 seven to the chemicals from the drilling of 18 wells. As Dr. Parkowski just beautifully exampled in her presentation, and Ms. Hill and, and last week, Dr. Richardson, all have shared with you that the CDC and EPA develop their standards using animals, and they are just not reflective of the levels that impact human beings. The assumptions made, oh, if we go 100 or 1,000 times less, we'll be clear. But as Dr. Kwiatkowski just said, they didn't test at that level. So we don't know other than by reporting. And we're talking about not so much nuisances, but true health impacts. 461 health complaints over an eight month period in Broomfield, most coming from within one mile of the Livingston pad where the air monitors are showing levels below published health guidelines uh, is an affirmation that the CDC and EPA levels are too high. If you look at this aerial view of the location of the health complaints relative to the Livingston pad, you can see the effects are experienced more than a mile away from any of the drill sites. What's also relevant is topography, and I won't go into that right now unless you have some questions about it, but air movements do make a difference and they follow the topography of the earth. Anthem Ranch is more than 85% of our residents are 65 or older. Uh, wild grass, which is southwest of the Livingston pad, and Anthem Highlands, which is east and north of the Livingston Pad, are predominantly younger professionals with young children or pregnant wives. All of the chemicals being considered tend to have stronger negative impacts on prenatal, the very young, and those of us who are chronologically enriched. Uh, this is not hypothetical. These are real people with very real health challenges. In a talk I had given recently, a person asked me a, a very chilling question. They wanted to know if I had any long-term impacts 
from having spent a year exposed to the oil and gas industry's chemicals? Well, my answer was, uh, it's too soon to tell. However, over the last month, two trips to the ER, three doctor's visits, a significant procedure, all looking for answers, has me wondering. Specific deaths and many of the chemicals industry uses uh, are carcinogenic, and I'm still awaiting the answers for my personal issues. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Spies. Um, now I'd like to address how larger setbacks might, may affect operators in practice. Under SB 181, the focus of this commission needs to be on public health. But some of the industry parties have suggested that a 2,500 foot setback would eliminate nearly half the land in Weld County from development. And PDC asserted that such a setback would eliminate 95% of its anticipated well locations. Those estimates greatly overstate the impact because they only look at the surface impact, the surface area covered by a 2,500 foot setback. Essentially what those estimates do is draw a circle around each house on the surface with a radius of 2,500 feet and then measure the area, the surface area covered by those, by those circles. But to get a real sense of the impact from a setback, you need to account for horizontal drilling. Today, operators are routinely drilling 10,000 feet to 15,000 feet horizontally. So to evaluate a setback, you can't just look at the surface area affected. Instead, the real question is how much space is remaining that operators can use to reach the areas within the setback horizontally. And that question has been studied by several researchers for a range of different setback distances from 1,500 feet 2,500 feet and even further. At the low end of about 1,500 feet, the Colorado School of Mines in 2019 did a GIS analysis taking into account two mile horizontal drilling reaches. And that analysis found that a 1,500 foot setback would have a negligible impact on, on the accessible minerals. It, it estimated that in Weld County, almost 99% of the minerals would still be available. Now, this study actually overstates the likely impact here because it assumed a setback from all buildings, not just from homes, and it also assumed the setback applied to waterways, which is not an issue with residential setbacks under Rule 604. Um, in addition, in 2018, an oil and gas and analytics firm took it a step further um, and evaluated mineral holdings held by several major operators in northeastern Colorado including Noble, Anadarko, which is now Oxy, PVC, and some others, to assess how they would be affected by larger setbacks. That analysis found that with a 1,500-foot setback, the operator's mineral rights would be minimally affected. The only company that would experience a material impact was extraction. These findings are also consistent with what the staff has concluded with these rules. In the statement of basis or purpose, the staff estimate that a 1,500-foot setback would be workable for all stakeholders. Now, it's important to note that both of these studies were assuming that companies could only drill two miles or 10,000 feet horizontally. But today, less than two years later, companies are actually drilling three miles horizontally. And so the impacts of a setback are, are even less than, than they indicate here. Um, as we've discussed though, the, the health literature supports a setback in the 2,500 foot range, not just 1,500 feet. And the GIS studies also address impacts from setbacks in the range of 2,000 feet to 2,500 feet. According to the Colorado School of Mines, a 2,000 foot setback, if you assume two mile horizontals, would allow an average of 88% of the subsurface to be recovered, the subsurface minerals to be recovered. And if you go to a three mile horizontal, more than 95% of the available minerals in the subsurface would be recoverable with a 2000 foot setback. If you go to a 2500 foot setback and two mile horizontal wells, uh, the, the School of Mines estimated that 75% of the subsurface would still be available. And with a 2500 foot setback, if operators use three mile horizontals, they would be able to recover almost 90% 90, 90 or 
of the subsurface. Again, these figures in the School of Mines report evaluate a setback that applies not just to homes, but to all buildings, and also applies to water bodies. And so these figures would actually overstate the impact of a residential setback under Rule 604. In short, under SB 181, setbacks should be set at 2,500 feet in order to protect public health and welfare. But what these figures show is that protecting public health with a 2,500 foot setback is also workable for operators. If this commission adopts a 2,500 foot setback, operators will still have access to about 90% of the subsurface minerals. And with that, we're happy to take any questions you have. In addition, uh, Ms. Hill and Dr. Kwiatkowski didn't go into details on some of the publications referenced Friday by the industry parties, but if you have questions on those, they can address them as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. Um, thank you to the panel. Um, I'll have the record reflect that during the uh, pendency of your presentation, we had uh, Commissioner Putnam join us. Glad to have Commissioner Putnam with us as well. Um, at this time, um, and ha as we have done with other panels, uh, this panel is subject to questions from commissioners. Um, and so we can start with that. Uh, Ms. Hill, um, if we could get your screen um, shared again, I'd like to go over some of the slides that you had there. Sure, just one moment. And if you could go to the slide that showed the three types of analysis, risk assessment, noise exposures, and Got a pretty picture of a mountain. There we go. There we go. Yeah. Can you further explain this? You were sort of rushed through your testimony, and I'd like to make sure we fully understand what you were trying to get at here. Yeah, absolutely. There was definitely a lot to cover, um, so I, I definitely had to, to speak quickly. But um, essentially on this slide, this shows the studies that um, I considered in my review of the literature. Um, and the, the scope of my review is actually included in Exhibit 1 in, in my written testimony. Um, but really, I wanted to evaluate the, the peer-reviewed literature, so only peer-reviewed studies um, that evaluate proximity to and density of oil and gas development and health risks. And what this means in looking at the EPI studies, you notice there's, two, there's 22 studies included there. These are epidemiological studies, observational studies that look at um, exposures and health outcomes. And these studies, the reason that there's this particular study count is because um, I had excluded some studies that look at um, presence and absence of oil and gas development in a community. That doesn't really help you address the question of proximity as a risk factor. And so I had excluded some of those uh, weaker study designs relevant to the setback question. And then also um, excluded some studies that rely only on self-reported data that hasn't been physician reviewed or that didn't use validated study um, survey questionnaire methods. And so those study, studies were excluded from my assessment. So in addition to the epidemiological literature, there's also four noise studies included here. Three of these noise studies were conducted in Colorado, um, and one was conducted in uh, West Virginia that looked at compressor stations. And then the four air mon monitoring and modeling risk assessment studies um, were featured across uh, various testimonies. This includes the CDPHE report, which also um, has a peer-reviewed companion study, Holder et al. 2019. It also includes other risk assessment uh, studies, including the two recent peer-reviewed risk assessments looking at air pollution, oil and gas development, McKenzie et al. 2018 and McMullen et al. 2018. Thank you. Um, if we could go to your sixth slide, which is the CTEH limitations. Yes. Can you sort of speak to that? Because we heard from Dr. McMullen, who eloquently opined that um, things were not as bad and um, had, I think, you know, come to conclusions that are different than yours. And I'm trying to balance all this out. 
Yeah, absolutely. So um, I want to note that the, you know, I reviewed the CTEH report and in general, I think that uh, Dr. McMullen had compared the appropriate um, exposure health guidance values that are available to the exposure durations that were considered. Um, however, what I wanted to point out is that uh, Dr. McMullen only looked at acute exposures and she only looked at a single compound. And what we know in other re recent risk assessment studies and what we know about the reality of oil and gas development is there are numerous uh, compounds, health relevant compounds that are associated with oil and gas development. And so in looking at benzene alone, you miss uh, some of the pictures. So, so for example, just to, just to name another compound, toluene is, is a relevant health relevant compound it operates along a sim similar target organ pathway and it would contribute to non-cancer acute risk. Um, however, there were no measurements of toluene included in the assessment uh, in, in this CDPH report. And then um, finally, the, the other assessments, as I mentioned before, I really wanted to focus on the peer reviewed literature in everything that I had, I had considered. Um, and this is a, a new report, you know, it just came out July 30th. Um, it was commissioned by the Colorado Oil and Gas Association um, and, and reported by CTEH. Uh, to my knowledge, the, the data in this report has not been peer reviewed. Thank you. Could you go back up a slide or two to the fourth slide? So 20 of 22 studies reported at least one statistically significant health finding. How do we know how far? I mean, how do you get to distance? Oh, I see. I see. So this, this gets at the question of the exposure, the proximity-based exposure metrics uh, used. So if you don't mind, actually, I'm going to go switch over to another slide because I think that's going to be um, pretty helpful. Um, the uh, the proximity-based exposure metrics, um, some of the, the elements that I've included on this slide, these, these metrics are quantitative. You can think of them as like an index that take into account a variety of different factors all at the same time. So they would take into account distance, they would take into account well density, and in some of the more recent studies, again, they would add in activity phase information and production from a, a specific well all into one estimate or one number. And what that means is that those estimates can be uh, tricky, difficult, and it's, it's nearly impossible for most of the studies to disaggregate proximity alone from, uh, from these types of metrics. Um, all of that being said, though, proximity is the primary component that's assessed in, in all of these studies. And, pri and proximity is also you know, the, the fundamental risk factor here. You, you care less about well density if the dense, density of wells that's high is far away from human populations. Um, and so getting back to, I think, a, a bit more of your question here, the studies here look at um, buffer, uh, a buffer radius, so radial distance, and some of the studies look within uh, a kilometer, two kilometers, and so the maximum distance uh, reviewed in, in the studies that I looked at consider exposures out to 10 miles. Um, and the other thing I want to know is that these metrics tend to associate uh, exposure as being greater or there's heavier weight placed on the wells that are closest to the residents. So obviously a nearby well pad is going to be much more relevant from an exposure uh, pathway as compared to wells that are further away. Thank you. You conclude uh, on your last slide uh, a proposed setback of at least 2,000 feet. Um, the other witness, Dr. Kadawaski, I don't know how to pronounce the last name, um, concluded 2,500 feet. Can, can you help provide perspective on these various distances and how do you get to one versus another versus another? Absolutely, yeah. The, the 2,000 foot uh, minimum setback distance is really based on the initial, the proposed recommendations for school and child care centers. And then it's also based on the maximum distance evaluated in the CDPH 2019 um, assessment, which has, has many strengths and, and to my understanding has been incorporated in, in the consideration of different distances and coming up with um, the, the proposed um, recommendations. And so those are the, the two primary factors. However, taking into account the, the body of peer-reviewed epidemiological literature that looks at distances beyond the 2,000 feet and, and considers those distances as well, um, and also considering the um, remaining uncertainty and unknowns as highlighted very well um, by Dr. Kwiatkowski, and then additionally taking into account 
the, uh, the nuisance and complaints that have been observed at greater distances than 2,000 feet. I think all of that together um, would also provide support for a minimum setback distance of, of 2,500 feet. I'll notice that, uh, you know, the, the setback distance I have here is at least 2,000 feet. So a setback of 2,500 would also align with my recommendations. Thank you, Ms. Hill. Uh, I do not have further questions um, of you at this point in time. I would turn to my fellow commissioners to in determine whether they have questions at this point. Commissioner Nanjapa. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you all for uh, your presentations. Uh, this was really helpful and informative. Um, I had a couple of different questions. Uh, first one, um, I will ask Ms. Hill. Um, you had mentioned about um, some of the studies that you excluded uh, because they were maybe not directly related to oil and gas development. Um, but I'm just curious, do we, did, did the other studies or do you have an understanding of kind of the, the background rates of some of these same um, uh, conditions that are observed? And was that used as a comparison uh, in these studies in order to determine the, the greater risk with the association of, of oil and gas development? Could you just kind of um, expound on that a little bit further if possible? Sure, and I'm gonna just switch over to, to this slide if that's all right, just to provide a, a little bit more visual here. So um, the, the different epidemiological studies consider different factors. So comparing um, uh, rates or prevalence of a particular condition like asthma in a community, you can take that um, at the county level and compare that to asthma rates you may see in a particular study. There's a study in California that does that. Um, I would say that that's actually a, a weaker way to go about um, comparisons. Uh, the studies, the more complex studies uh, that are included in, in my review, things like case control studies, can match individuals by potential confounding variables that may influence their development. Of a, of a particular outcome. So case control studies, for, for example, can match someone that develops an, uh, a particular health outcome of a particular age or a particular sex with someone who has the same type of demographic characteristics. Um, but for some reason, one develops the, you know, the outcome of concern and the other doesn't. And you look at the potential for exposure among those two individuals to compare. So that's one, one I think, stronger way of, of making those types of comparisons. And I also want to note that in, uh, in some of the written testimony provided by uh, industry and, and other parties, they really question some of, some of the methodologies. They, they compare them more to you know, comparing to countywide levels or comparing um, uh, the development of health outcomes uh, in, in a cross-sectional approach. And so uh, they really claim that you know most of the studies are use weaker design weaker study design methods. Weaker des study design methods would be the first three categories you can see from top to bottom on this slide. And I would consider, well, again, every study has its strength and limitation. The bottom three methodologies tend to be stronger uh, stronger methods. And you can see of the proportion of all the studies, um, the epidemiological studies considered in this assessment the methods used tend to be on the stronger side. Again, every study has its limitation, but I wanted to make sure to note that as well. Continue, Ms. Nanjapa, sorry. Thank you, no, no problem, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much. I appreciate that explanation and, and that's helpful um, to look at this in, in terms of the explanation that you provided with, with those different types of um, comparisons. Uh, let's see. I think um, the next question I have is for Dr. Kwiatkowski. Um, you had mentioned the various studies that included some of the uh, different taxa groups of animals. Um, were those primarily lab studies or were there also some um, ecological studies that were conducted? And um, could you just elaborate a little bit more about some of that, uh, those data that you looked at? Sure. They were all laboratory studies. Um, some of them used a mixture of known um, oil and gas associated chemicals, fracking fluid, and uh, a, a, a list of chemicals that was put together by the scientists who did the study. And um, others used actual samples from water nearby um, at the fracking 
activities and exposed their uh, animals uh, to those chemicals and then measured the health outcomes. A lot of them are looking at um, hormone impacts directly, so especially in the cellular research, research, you know, they're not looking at health outcomes so much as what is impacting different hormones and then the known um, data on how those hormones impact things like birth outcomes uh, sort of connects the dots there. Further follow-up? Um, let's see, I think I have one more question and that was for uh, Mr. Freeman. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kwiatkowski. Um, this was just, I, I just wanted to better understand um, when you were describing this, the Colorado School of Mines study, uh, you mentioned that at the 2000 foot um, setback distance, that there was 88% of subsurface availability at, at two, with two mile laterals, but it was greater with three mile. So I was trying to understand why is that the case that it's, there's more availability at a greater distance? And that was sure. true for the 2500 as well. Sure. So I think the important distinction, uh, in, in fact, can I share my screen for a moment here? That might help. Yeah, um, please do. Okay. Um, so um, there's two distances that I'm, I'm talking about here. You know, the first distance is the length of the setback, whether it's 2,500 feet or 500 feet or 1,500 feet. The second measurement, um, and the, study, the school mine studies looked at setbacks of 1,500, 2,000 feet, and 2,500 feet. The second variable that they were looking at is um, how long companies can, how far companies can drill horizontally. And, um, you know, their first assumption was they could drill two miles, about 10,000 feet. Um, and if you assume that they can drill uh, 2,000 feet um, horizontally, if you apply a 2,000 foot setback there, they can recover, according to their estimate, about 88% of the subsurface minerals on average in Colorado. Mm -hmm. um, if you, but if you assume instead that they're not drilling 10,000 feet horizontally, but actually closer to 15,000 feet horizontally or three miles, the amount of subsurface they can reach with a 2,000 foot setback goes up to over 95% or almost all the minerals basically. So there's the two factors are how long the setback is and how far uh, companies are assumed to be able to drill horizontally. Does that, does that help? I think so, yeah, thank you very much. Sure. I don't have any further questions, Mr. Chair, thank you. Thank you, other commissioners with questions for this panel? Mr. Chair? Yeah, Commissioner Gonzalez. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr. Freeman, good morning. Um, I wanted to ask you some follow-up questions from uh, Commissioner Nanjapa's last question about the uh, the lateral length and, and kind of how you came up with some of those numbers. Um, could, could you talk about how the percentage of subsurface availability is determined? Um, because not all, I mean, not all, uh, I'm sorry, the, the percentage of subsurface availability is determined based on the, the setbacks themselves. And so what I'm, what I'm getting at is that not all surface is created equal just because there's openings in the setbacks doesn't mean that it's appropriate for, you know, for safe development. So I'm curious how that number came about and some of the factors that, that applied into that percentage. Certainly. So both of these studies that I'm talking about were, were basically GIS analyses. They were intended to assume that, you know, ev that every other place that wasn't covered by a setback is appropriate to drill. The, the, the aim of these studies was to assess the magnitude of impact from a given setback distance. And what they did was do a GIS analysis that, um, you know, plotted the circles at 1,500 feet, 2,000 feet, 2,500 feet around home, around buildings, and then assessed how much of the surface uh, was left, uh, assuming a, a 10,000 foot or 15,000 foot horizontal drilling reach. And as part of that, they assumed that uh, they didn't look at, they didn't count only very small specks of land that were outside the setbacks. I think the school of mine assumed that you needed, I think, 10 acres of, of open land in order for a service location. I think the, 
industry study you may have assumed seven and a half acres. So they were looking at um, outside each distance setback, is there a large enough area of land um, to put a well pad, a service location, in order to reach under the setback distance or whatever distance it was. But certainly, you know, none of these factored in there, you know, in any given well pad location, there will be other factors at issue besides just the setbacks. And um, these didn't try to address that. It was more to get a sense of, of the magnitude and scope of impact from any given setback. Thank you for that. That, that. that that makes sense, you know, with the limitations of being, you know, not being able to be on site for, for each one of those 10 acre parcels of land. Um, so I appreciate the, the clarification there, Mr. Freeman. Thank you. Um, can you also talk about the, the, the subsurface minerals, right? So you talked about accessibility of subsurface minerals. How is that defined? I mean, we're not assuming there's minerals under every piece of subsurface in Colorado. No, I mean, I think you're right. For the purpose of the analysis, I think the School of Mines was just using uh, you know, the operators are, are pursuing or minerals, which are all under the subsurface. They were looking at how much of the subsurface is available for mineral development. Commissioner Gonzalez, follow up. Uh, is that, is that uh, mine study reference in your, in your uh, testimony materials? It is, it is. We, um, we didn't uh, cover the, um, that in our response pre-hearing statements because the argument from industry came up in their response pre-hearing, but we, it's submitted uh, with our testimony. There's a folder of all the relevant studies and both the, the school of mine studies is there, that's under Ericsson. Uh, and then the industry analysis is under uh, called, a company called RS Energy. Um, and I think this may, may help go to your question. The RS Energy study does actually plot where the mineral uh, minerals owned by different companies are located. Uh, and they cover, they, they plot the minerals held by Noble, uh, Bonanza Creek, High Point, no, a number of other ones. And they, they actually break it out by, by company in terms of what the impacts are for each company. Okay, thank you, Mr. Freeman. I'll, I'll dig into those a little bit deeper, see if I can get some more clarity uh, to some of these questions. Um, I, I guess I wanna talk about three mile laterals. Uh, there haven't been many in Colorado. I'm curious if you quantified how many there have been um, and, and maybe, uh, what that looks like. I'm, I'm optimistic for the future, but but technology grows as it grows. So so how many three mile laterals have been drilled in Colorado so far? Well, I can't tell you the exact number, but I can tell you, we've looked at the commission's GIS website and it took about five minutes last weekend for me to find the number of uh, recently permitted, I believe recently drilled uh, wells by extraction in Northeastern Colorado that had about 14.5 horizontal reach. And I think it was one well pad with I, it was a number of wells going that far off of it, and that was not the only one. There was others. So I think, um, I think this is something that operators are doing now. It's not, um, it's not just a, uh, something that could potentially happen in the future. Thank you, Mr. Freeman, and thanks to all the other witnesses. Other questions from commissioners? Commissioner Nanjapa. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Freeman, I had one additional question and that was related to uh, what you had discussed, um, also related to the Colorado School of Mines study, but with respect to distance from waterways. Um, I was curious, we heard the testimony from some of the wildlife um, and hunting and angling groups um, and they had proposed uh, 500 feet um, in high priority habitat and then uh, a quarter mile, uh, especially in those segments uh, where there are the, the gold medal segments um, uh, in the presence of cut, cutthroat trout. Um, did you have any thoughts on their recommendations or how this study um, relates to that or in terms of your, your thoughts in, in terms of setbacks for riparian areas? Sure. Uh, you know, to be honest, uh, we would su certainly support their proposal. Uh, in our analysis here, we were, uh, we didn't try to, uh, calibrate the school of mines assumptions with their assumptions. Um, my, my, I can only guess that uh, applying their proposed setbacks to the school of mine assumptions would, uh, you know, the, the impact on development from their assumption would be less than what the school of mines is assuming because it's simply a smaller setback. Does that, does that answer the, your question? Yes, thank you very much. Other questions from commissioners? Commissioner McGowan. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thanks for everyone's testimony today. I think my question is gonna be for Ms. Hill, or I'm not sure if it's Dr. Hill. I feel like it's, everyone's a doctor. So I'll just call you Dr. Hill. Um, <laughs> I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about all the studies that you looked at, and if you could remind me again, which ones looked at chronic long-term health outcomes and which ones um, looked at acute and what those outcomes were? Sure, hold on one second. I'm just gonna bring up that slide again because it's pretty helpful. Okay, great. If you can see my screen here. Um, so uh, your question about long-term outcomes. I would say that um, a lot of times in the peer-reviewed literature, it's a lot more, and I think Dr. Richardson commented on this last week, the, the longer latency or the longer of the time between a potential exposure and an outcome that you're looking at, it requires follow-up. Um, it requires uh, a lot of times a lot more money to conduct those studies. And so you end up seeing uh, those chronic types of uh, outcomes assessed a lot uh, more infrequently. And so the cancer study here, you'll, there's only a single study looking at cancer outcomes. Um, that study actually was conducted in Colorado and, and it found that there was increased risk for acute lymphocytic leukemia among individuals that were five to 24 years old. So um, it's classified under childhood cancer, but really it's among these young individuals. Um, for the most part, uh, many of these other outcomes that you see listed here are more related to acute exposures. The, the perinatal outcomes, the prenatal outcomes, for example, are related to exposures while uh, an infant is, is in utero and in the womb. Um, and for some of those studies, they're able to look at acute exposures you know, by tri trimester and kind of break that out. Um, the other study that I think is particularly interesting from more of a chronic perspective is the study looking at um, indications of cardiovascular disease, um, looking at a, a range of different um, uh, biomarkers that would indicate cardiovascular disease, looking at blood pressure in individuals, and that study was also conducted in Colorado. Please. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So um, I'm wondering too if you could, um, I know in Colorado we have low birth rate in general for those who are living at higher elevation, there is a correlation. And did those studies um, take into account the fact that there are other factors that feed into, for example, low birth rate, premature um, outcomes here in Colorado? Yeah, absolutely. That's a that's a great point. And elevation wasn't wasn't something that I had noted on on that other slide. But um, there are two studies in Colorado that look at um, birth outcomes. One was actually the the landmark study, one of the first uh, epidemiological studies to look at oil and gas development and, and proximity. Um, for that study, I'm not sure if elevation was assessed, but I believe in the recent study. It's one of the two studies at least looks at elevation as a potential confounder. Thank you, and thanks for putting all these um, studies together. It was very helpful. Sure. Further questions, Commissioner Messner. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you to this panel. I really appreciate the depth of information that was provided. I think it was, uh, uh, it was a really good testimony, and it certainly helped me um, uh, as I'm looking at and, and, and analyzing all of the information that's provided. So I want to just initially say thank you. And thank you to the fellow commissioners for asking most of my questions already. Um, but uh, I did have one, and this may not be an appropriate question, um, for this particular panel, but I want to throw it out there in general because it was something that I was noodling on over the weekend um, as I was thinking about and reading more testimony and uh, um, and just got a, a rereading um, some of the pre-hearing statements. Um, but when we're talking about these chemicals of concern that potentially have health impacts, my question is, are these chemicals introduced chemicals into oil and gas operations, or are they natural chemicals inherent in uh, oil and gas operations? So are these chemicals coming out of the ground 
naturally as part of the extraction process or are these chemicals introduced uh, by operators as part of the um, oil and gas operations. So I throw that out there in general. Other folks can certainly answer that as well, but if anyone has comments here, I'd love to hear it. Um, I could probably uh, start with that and, and others can add. Um, so I think that there are, are three different categories that I consider when, when thinking about kind of the chemical stressors associated with oil and gas development. So the first would be the, the air pollutants or compounds that are found in the reservoir um, and you're likely to see them uh, you know in different oil and gas basins um, so common exposures based on like common types of pollutants so benzene B the btex compounds for example are naturally occurring and found within the reservoir and then the second category i think is chemical additives that are used not only during hydraulic fracturing and other well stimulation techniques but also chemical additives are used for routine uh, well maintenance, they're typically not reported um, through frac focus and, and other data sets um, to the same degree as um, compounds that are reported during hydraulic fracturing, but at least an analysis in, in California that has access to data for routine operations like maintenance and things like that found sig significant overlap between the chemicals that are used in well stimulation activities and then also routine oil and gas well maintenance. Um, and then the third category I would say is actually um, chemicals don't necessarily stay in their parent uh, compound format. They interact with other things in the subsurface under high pressure and high temperature. And so the third category would be there are chemical interactions that may mean that what's being brought up uh, out of the hole may not necessarily match entirely what went down um, uh, as well. So those are, those are kind of like the three different categories I think about. I don't know if others have, have more to add. I would just like to add a little bit to that, that the chemicals that are typically measured in my circles that I showed in my slide, um, there's sort of, there's a suite of chemicals that have been measured, you know, there's EPA um, panels that have certain chemicals and there's analytical methods and those have been measured for a really long time in a lot of different um, situations and so they're some of them are combustion related and so they've been looking at them as air pollutants and 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 some of them are you know greenhouse gas related there's and so they're well known and they're well studied and scientists can apply them and measure what's what's in the air those tend to be the ones that are coming out of the ground from you know their native chemicals um, that are uh, coming up from the reservoir as Ms. Hill said um, the other chemicals, uh, you know, I don't have a really good way to describe them, but they are, a lot of them are confidential, so we're not real sure, but they are chemicals that industry uses for specific functions when they're doing drilling in the fracking. And drilling is a lot of it, which we don't have really good information on what chemicals are used in drilling um, at all. And um, as Dr. Spee said, during drilling is, is a potential um, high exposure um, activity, and we don't know much about what those chemicals are. So in these air studies, we're not even really measuring a lot of the chemicals that are what the additives that are put down whole in order to um, carry out the, the, the process. We also know from the uh, analysis of the SUMA canisters that both Ajax Analytics CSU and, and uh, CDPHE, as well as the ones individuals have collected, when they do the analysis, they can identify those chemicals that come from, for example, traffic versus those that come from oil and gas activities. And they specifically identify uh, the source of those chemicals. Further questions, Commissioner Messner? No, thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, Dr. Spees, um, I had a, a follow-up question, or maybe it's just a comment. Um, I have appreciated your participation before us, um, both as a uh, resident of Anthem Ranch um, and bringing some perspective about uh, impacts and concerns from drilling nearby, and as a perspective as a scientist. And so I wanted you to uh, make sure that you could acquaint the panel 
um, or the commissioners with your scientific background, again, um, if you don't mind. And then also just sort of, um, I know you were sort of hurried with testimony. Is, is there anything further that you wanted to bring um, to, you know, to the table for our consideration? Thank you. Uh, my background is as in the sciences. Um, I have an undergraduate master's in both chemistry and biology, a doctorate in biology and in education, then a postdoc in protein biochemistry. But for 18 years, I taught environmental sciences, health, pathophysiology, cell biology every semester. So it puts all of those elements that we're talking about uh, with the studies you know, as in, in my mind, and in, when I came to Colorado, actually before I came to Colorado, being in Pennsylvania, when the Marcella Shale was beginning <clears throat> to be drilled in the early 2000s, the industry didn't have it right at all in Pennsylvania. And thank goodness things have improved for Colorado, but it's still not where it needs to be to protect the health, safety, and welfare of, of human beings and our environment. Um, but it became evident that there is a, a, a tug between our insatiable desire for petroleum products and our essential desire to live. And they're at crosshairs when the two come too close to each other. So my background, having been an advocate, having worked with the uh, Secretary of the Environment in Pennsylvania, having served in Broomfield on the Oil and Gas Update Committee, developing the standards and the guidelines in Colorado, and, and particularly in Broomfield, rather. Um, so that I have that background. I also served as a uh, a Dean of Math, Science, and Engineering in California, and then ultimately was Chancellor of one of Penn State University's regional colleges. So I, I have the, all right, let's look at the big picture capabilities, the ability to put pieces together and, and try to get people to come together to talk and let's find best way for us to survive and, um, and still feed our, our desire for petroleum products. Um, but we're, we're moving away from that. I'm happy about that. But, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're never going to get rid of the Livingston pad out behind my house. That will always be there. But in the future, looking at where else are we building oil and gas development areas, it must be much further away from residential areas. And as Mike and Dr. Kwiatkowski and Michelle have all said, the 2,500 feet really is sort of a minimum. And uh, you asked, was there anything else? And you know, I didn't talk about topography, but Mike, I don't know, if, can you bring up that one map of the health complaints? Sure. Thank you. Broomfield was so far ahead of the curve in being proactive and wanting to give residents an opportunity to tell people when there were health impacts. So to orient you on this map, Mike, if you can run your cursor around the Northwest Parkway. So it goes right through here. Yeah, right. Oh. Whoops. <laughs> Lowell comes from the bottom south up north. Yep. There, right through there. So just to the west of Lowell, the center circle is where the Livingston pad is. And the, it's interesting, there are a number of health complaints, and I suspect they are also noise complaints that are right inside that, right by the pad. My house is on the edge of that first circle. And you see, yeah, the, that intense number of yellow dots just to the north and west of the Livingston Pad represents residents of Anthem Ranch. And you notice it moves up north and they become less frequent, but 
There's also a cluster just south of Highway 7. Yes, right there, Mike, you, you got it. And east of Lowell. Those are folks that are living in Anthem Highlands, but they are also getting air from pads that are north of us. If you get a wind rose with the, the winds coming from the northeast, moving southwest, you know those people are getting impacted right in that area. The area that I mentioned about topography, Mike, if you would go to the east of Lowell, where Anthem High, yeah, right there, that cluster, that's tight cluster, uh, just, yes, right there. That tight cluster of complaints are residents in Anthem Highlands and there is an interesting topographical phenomenon. The southwest corner of that is low, it's equal with the pad, and it rises up going to the northeast. So it's a natural bowl, natural amphitheater, if you will. So noise coming from the pad actually was just enhanced in that area and also chemicals that they're all heavier than air. So they follow the topography, they get hung up, can't get over that ridge. Um, there were a lot of complaints coming from Anthem Highlands as well. Anthem Ranch and uh, Wild Grass, which is Southwest, are all lower than the pad. Now again, the heavier air falls down, it follows the land, and that's why people are being so impacted. So that's, thank you for the opportunity to explain that, Mr. Robbins. Thank you, Dr. Spees. Uh, Mr. Freeman, um, I had a couple of sort of final follow-up questions for you. Um, your group has advocated for a 2,500 foot uh, setback. Um, can you opine on two different pieces to that? One is, do you have um, thoughts about the concept that others have discussed, which is that the setback is not hard, but instead it could be waivable um, after some form of hearing before the commission and provided the commission makes a finding that even if a lesser setback is allowed or a location is allowed, that is sufficiently protective. Um, so that's one question. And then the sort of second question is um, a setback is, um, defined based upon how you measure it. And so does, do, do, do you have some thoughts um, about um, whether the measurement should be from the well, whether the measure, measurement should be from the working pad surface edge, and then whether the measurement should be to the school property line or the property line of the impacted building unit? Sure, so let me, if I could take your, your second question first. Um, we actually support the staff proposal to measure the setback from the edge of the pad. Um, and the reason for that is simply as, as the staff indicated Friday that um, there is production equipment closer to the edge of the pad than the wellhead, things like tanks. And so if the goal is to ensure that there's separation between people's homes and production operations, the edge of the pad seems like the appropriate marker to use. Um, in terms of measuring the other end of the distance for you know the property line of the school or the home um i do think that the proposal i believe it was by adams county friday to base that based on the property line of the school or the home would be an appropriate way to do it simply for ease of administration and safety because it, it's much clearer there won't be a dis dispute over what buildings are involved or kids are in their front yard they'll still get the full benefit of the, of the protection um, in terms of the your first question regarding uh, deviation from setback, you know we would ask the commission to not allow any variances or deviations from the setback distances. Um, and the reason for that is really you know the um, the purpose of the setback in large part is to set a clear line uh, for uh, companies and the public to know where oil and gas development isn't going to be allowed and where and where companies could plan accordingly and. In thinking about setback, we urge the commission 
to not just consider existing operator mineral rights and existing projects, but also to look at this going forward over the longer term. And over the longer term, one of the really important benefits of a setback is that it uh, provides a clear standard, a clear line for companies and operators to use in, in acquiring minerals and planning their development. They have a clear guidance about where they, about areas they know where they should uh, stay away from. And I think uh, you heard that on Friday with Mr. Duranlo's uh, point that after they adopted the current setbacks in, I think it was 2013, they saw between 2014 and 2019, a significant drop in the number of new locations proposed within the buffer zone and the exception zone. And I can't go into exactly the cause for it, but I suspect that that had to do with companies knowing where, where those lines were drawn. And I think if the commission adopts a 2,500 foot setback or whatever setback it adopts, um, you can expect to see over the, over the course of years, companies planning accordingly, acquiring minerals outside those distances. And ultimately, I think the benefit of the setback there is that will reduce conflicts between residents and the public over the long haul. Um, the other part of the reason why we, I think we strongly, or another reason why we oppose granting variances on setbacks is that, you know, another one of the benefits of them is that they push operators to improve their, uh, it's a technology forcing measure, that it drives them to find new ways to access the minerals where it's difficult to get, to find uh, new technologies, better ways to get at them that they wouldn't have to, to use in the event of, of, a, of a shorter, more modest setback. And I think that's where the two mile to three mile horizontal reach comes into play, is that, um, if, is that if companies are required to, to stay farther away from homes, it'll drive them to do further technological improvements like expanding the horizontal reach of the development. Now, um, we will say, as I said, we, we would ask the commission not to allow um, any deviations, but if the, they are going to allow um, uh, one, we urge that it be done only through rule, rule 502 and with a very, very high standard for commission hearing and, and not permit variances based simply on the operator representation as the technical and economic feasibility. And part of the reason for that is that, and part of really the value of a setback is that in any kind of site specific location um, decision or dispute, the public is invariably and inevitably at a disadvantage. In the company, when, it's, when this is looked at on a site specific basis, the company will have already, the company will be doing the alternative location analysis, uh, likely under the proposed rules. The company will have already acquire the mineral rights. Presumably the company will already have entering into service use agreements. And so when this is done at a site specific level, the company in most cases will already have significantly narrowed the range of available options. Um, and so that's part of why the public is so, um, view setbacks is so important is because the commission needs to draw a, a clear standard and a hard line about keep about where drilling is allowed and ensuring that locations are kept away from homes. And to the extent the commission allows variances, it undercuts and, and weakens the value of those protections. So um, for that reason, we, we ask you to not allow any deviations or variances, but if the commission does consider variances from setbacks, we urge that they be only allowed under 502 and only permitted with, and with a setting a really high bar. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. Um, one final question for me to you. Um, you cited the School of Mines study, which made some positive findings about the workability of land, even with back when 112 was being debated, the COGCC published a study that had uh, lesser amounts of land being developable under 112. Now knowing 112, which was an initiative, um, was 2,500, but it also included the vulnerable lands piece. But I just, you know, I need you to help reconcile or speak to that issue. I'm sure that that is gonna come up 
Um, and so I want to make sure that we've got the record balanced when you're speaking to the School of Mind study versus the COGCC study versus what 112 was versus what a just setback that doesn't have vulnerable, vulnerable areas, if you could speak. Sure. To so the, the COGCC study um, you're talking about, uh, and this is actually was the basis for, I think, Noble's prediction that um, half of Well County would be unavailable for, for development. The, the commission study in 2018 only looked at the surface radius. So that what they were do, what the commission did was the GIS analysis I described earlier, where they plotted each address uh, or, or water body and drew a 2,500 foot circle around it and then measured the percentage of acreage countywide or, or statewide um, that would be covered by those circles. It didn't account for the impacts of the <clears throat> horse or the ability to, to drill horizontally. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, um, that study also assumed, you know, setbacks not just from residences, but from any building unit. So it was commercial, industrial would also have been covered by that. And of course it covered covered water bodies. Um, and what we're talking about here is a narrower set of buildings of only only residential units and accounting and it, the school mine study the school of mine study actually did cover all buildings, but it accounted for the horizontal drilling impact. Um, you know, and, and also in, in, in the interest of you know providing full balance, the, I would say that if it's you know um, in the industry study, it found um, the school of mines study assumed that if you went three miles, and it found really really good recoverability of minerals. Um, to go to Commissioner Gonzalez's question. The RS, the, the industry study found um, it didn't analyze three mile horizontals and it didn't analyze 2000 feet. It did find that for some companies, there would be a significant impact from a 2500 foot setback. Um, it varied based on their specific mineral acquisitions and some of them and, and depending how close they were. Um, so for example, extraction, even at 1500 would have a material impact. It would have a more significant impact at 2500. But overall, um, it found that it, you know, it was um, not nearly as extensive as, as industry is represented. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. Are there further questions for this panel from commissioners? Commissioner Nanjapa. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just have one more uh, for Dr. Uh, Kwiatkowski. Um, I just wanted to, I think you sort of said this in a, in a couple of different ways already, but I just wanted to make sure. Um, the studies that um, are, are looking at some of these epi epidemiological impacts, um, in many cases, we don't know the exact uh, chemicals that are involved because of some of the, the trade secret protections. Is that correct? But we're, so in other words, um, I guess a better way to ask the question maybe is, have there been specific sort of synergistic um, studies looking at multiple chemicals or combinations thereof, um, or because of the, the unknowns and to uh, Commissioner Messner's question about the differences in what's produced or what is released, um, you know, due to certain operations versus what is added for certain operations, um, are we looking at these studies more as a, as a sort of a surrogate with respect to proximity to the locations um, and the impacts that are observed or have there been specific studies that look at the, the combinations of, of some of the different chemicals involved? I hope that makes sense. <laughs> it's kind of yeah, a big question. It feels like <clears throat> a lot all in one question, but I, I think the answer is pretty straightforward. Um, there are just hundreds of chemicals that are used. I mean. Frac Focus lists out over a thousand chemicals that industry uses during hydraulic fracturing. And um, some of those, you know, the ones that are reported there, um, we could study them, but I don't think that we necessarily have the analytical methods to be able to measure them appropriately in the air at really low concentrations and then to be able to tie that to health outcomes. Plus, there are so many of them. Um, and then there are chemicals that are protected by confidential business information, so we don't even know what they are. So the, the possibility is that these epidemiological studies are showing that we have birth outcomes. Um, something is happening to cause those 
it could be any one of those chemicals that we've never even measured in the air. So, you know, there's just no way to know and we probably won't be able to know. And so those epidemiological studies carry a lot of weight because they're telling us sort of what is really going on on the ground. And what we've been doing in these air monitoring studies is taking this little subset of chemicals and saying, um, these are at really low levels. Um, it looks like these aren't causing the effects. There are problems with that, as I described, about how the, the low, the, what's a low level and what might cause, cause an effect in a, a developing organism in utero um, it is, is a different question than what would affect an adult. Um, uh, so, I, sorry, I lost my train of thought for a little bit there. I went from chemicals to health effects, but um, I think that you can't, we can't really know what's going on in that whole universe of possible chemicals. Um, for a variety of reasons. And uh, so we, we take what we do know and we try to use that as a, a proxy to assess what might be going on. Um, but not only is it a subset, but like I mentioned in the response to the previous question, it's a, it's a certain type of chemical. Those chemicals tend, to, they're common air pollutants and they come up from under, underground and, and they're in the air as you know combustion byproducts and whatnot. So, that's why we know so much about them. But these other possibly more designer or exotic chemicals, you know, it, it are really just a, a big unknown. And that's the uncertainty that drives the, the desire to be even more protective by having setbacks. Other questions? All right, uh, seeing no questions, um, we wanna thank the panel for their presentation. Um, very uh, good information for our consideration. Um, we will zoom this panel away and I will look to my fellow commissioners. Um, do you want to tackle another panel? It looks like the next panel has about uh, seven minutes um, of presentation and then we'll have questions or do you wanna take our first break? If everybody's comfortable, we'll go with the next panel. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> Appreciate that. Okay, um, we've got them on board. Um, this is uh, Western Resource Advocates. Ms. Walker, do you have your group with you? Yes, thank you. You have the floor. So we're going to hear from, uh oh, Adam was, oh, there he is. Sorry, sorry. We're going to hear from Adam Swatolsky, who's going to uh, support our proposal for a riparian setback. Okay, good morning and thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? We can. Great. Well, my name is Adam Swatolsky, and I'm appearing in support of the riparian setbacks proposed by Western Resource Advocates. Uh, I've spent two decades conducting research and working in the field with state and federal land managers to protect and restore riparian areas, wetlands, streams, and floodplains. Oops, sorry, just uh, overtook my uh, whole screen here. There we go. Um, from surface disturbing activities. So the importance of Colorado's riparian areas, wetlands, streams, and floodplains cannot be overstated. Although they only account for a very small portion of the land base, they protect public health and serve the public welfare. They provide water to growing communities, cultural and historic values, economic values such as recreation, aquatic and fish habitat, key terrestrial habitat and wildlife migration corridors. Healthy streams, floodplains, riparian areas, and wetlands filter pollutants, maintain and improve water quality, capture and store flood waters, and sustain surface water flow flows during dry periods. According to the state of Colorado, ephemeral and intermittent streams comprise at least 68% of Colorado stream miles and play a significant collective role in maintaining and defining the physical, chemical, and biological integrity of perennial waters. Colorado Parks and Wildlife state that, quote, relatively speaking, 
the conservation of wetlands and riparian areas has a greater positive impact on the diversity and vitality of Colorado's wildlife population than perhaps any other habitat conservation practice. Colorado's water resources are also some of the most endangered resources in the state. According to Colorado Parks and Wildlife, Colorado's wetland and riparian habitats, which only occupy 1.5% of the state, are quote, in peril. Wetlands and riparian areas have declined by 50% and quote, habitat loss and degradation continue. The Colorado Natural Heritage Program determined that most of the state's wetlands, particularly those important to the conservation of wetland dependent wildlife, are under significant stress with 34% of wetland dependent species considered rare or in peril. There is a scientific consensus that surface disturbances generally and oil and gas development specifically degrade streams, riparian areas, wetland and floodplains. Oil and gas development is a high intensity activity with substantial footprint, including well pads and roads. In our testimony, my colleague Allison Jones and I cite these many incremental and cumulative impacts, all of which are exacerbated by climate change. They include sedimentation, changes in channel morphology, water pollution, impairment of water quality and water supply, habitat loss and fragmentation, obstruction of migration corridors, and the introduction of weeds. Recognizing the importance and sensitivity of riparian areas, wetlands, streams, and floodplains, land managers have long used riparian buffers to protect them. Riparian buffers reduce the incremental and cumulative impacts of oil and gas development, such as stream and sedimentation, the risk of contamination of surface and groundwater, impairment of recreation and scenic values, and loss and fragmentation of wildlife habitat. And riparian buffers also maintain natural processes that filter water pollution and reduce the threat of flooding. For example, the Kremlin and White River BLM field offices imposed buffers on oil and gas operations because buffers were needed to maintain and improve water quality, visual and aesthetic quality, and recreation and wildlife habitat. In my written testimony, I gave several examples of existing riparian buffers that prevent surface disturbing activities in and around riparian areas, wetlands, floodplains, and streams. And these examples come from the Forest Service, the Bureau of Land Management, as well as the Wyoming Game and Fish, Fish and Game. In closing, riparian areas, wetlands, streams, and floodplains are unparalleled value to Colorado. However, they are already under great stress from development and climate change and are clearly vulnerable to future damage. Given the value and sensitivity of these waters, and existing and foreseeable adverse impacts to them, riparian buffers are necessary to protect, avoid, and minimize damage to Colorado's waters. Uh, thank you, and I would be happy to take any questions. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Ms. Walker, do you have, are, are you testifying? Do you have other witnesses, or is your, is, does this conclude your presentation? Well, that concludes our presentation. We were hoping to save time for uh, closing. Very good. Questions for this panel? Commissioner Nanjapa. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for that, uh, the testimony. Um, and so I'm just looking at this last slide here. Um, that one is mentioned as, as being based on the, the BLM um, requirements. In fact, if we, could, if we could put that back up, that would be helpful if possible. Um, I just wanted to take another look at that. I think um, I believe in your, uh, in the pre-hearing statement, um, there was there was a, a reference to the the vegetative boundary um, outside of the or the margin of the wetlands, um, 
And so, okay, this is the BLM. I think, okay, if you could go to your last slide, please. Um, I think that was the one. So I, just noticing that there are differences in the, num the feet, the distances that have been shown. Is this last slide what you are uh, recommending or suggesting in terms of the setbacks for these um, wetlands and riparian areas? I just wanted that clarification and then I have some follow-ups. So our, um, our proposal has two components to it. One mm -hmm. is sort of a hard, no surface occupancy part. And then there's a wider uh, buffer sort of like the internal and external buffer you dealt with in 411, that where the presumption is that there's no development. So there's sort of these two uh, Oh, We may have lost Ms. Walker. Yeah, um, Ms. Walker, you, unfortunately have frozen. Okay, well, I can try to finish uh, Jero's thought then. <laughs> uh, so the internal buffer would be the um, consistently across the board um, where you'd have something like the 500 foot um, setbacks. And then the outside buffer would also have that. Um, however, it, it would be kind of the, the burden of the oil and gas company to prove that there was no impact and, and there could be, um, those could be um, used if, if necessary, essentially. So um, kind of the, the hard and fast, and then the, there would be some flexibility in that outer buck. Okay, and thank you. And I, I but I, uh, so I guess I just wanted some additional clarification. So the internal buffer is 500 feet from the vegetative margin, is that correct? Or is it, uh, from the original high water mark, I'm, I'm I'm just trying to understand where are we considering the boundaries from or the measurement from. Oh, uh, Jura, are you back again? You have uh, you're muted, but but yes, it would be from the vegetative margin. Uh, and then, sorry, uh, Mr. Chair, if I may, one last follow up. Please. Um, there, we we heard from the wildlife uh, hunting and angling groups um, last week. And they were proposing 500 feet um, in uh, high priority habitat. Um, and they were talking about sort of the whole, uh, the whole uh, margin of the uh, riparian area, you know, beyond just the, the, uh, the banks, but um, into the vegetative margin and the, and the original high water mark. Um, and then uh, a quarter mile in certain segments where uh, we have the, the gold medal segments for cutthroat trout. Um, did you hear their testimony and, and do you have any comments on, on what they proposed? Uh, yes, I, I heard their testimony um, and, and would be supportive of it. And it seemed like they were um, primarily um, concerned about the blue ribbon trout streams. And I think our proposal would um, expand beyond just those particular trout streams to include uh, both perennial and intermittent, as, as well as ephemeral streams, which all provide in, important um, uh, functions for, for both um, wildlife habitat, as well as water quality for um, humans as well. So I think our, our proposal um, would certainly support theirs, but it expands it into more areas. Okay, thank you. And, and sorry, Mr. Chair, one last, one additional follow-up. Um, so the, the wetlands, um, as you're proposing, I appreciate that additional inclusion. I, I, I do recognize the importance of, of wetland habitat as, along with riparian habitat. Um, the, the question though is that, you know, wetlands are uh, many different sizes. So is there a particular size guideline that you're um, using? Is it kind of the EPA definition? Um, are these easily mappable? Um, can you can you kind of elaborate a little bit further on that? Jero, did you want to? Are you um, back? Well, it, it, it's my understanding that um, you, you know most um, 
there, there are GIS layers available to be able to uh, delineate these buffers around wetlands. And, and I think that the EPA guidance uh, and their um, GIS layers would, would probably be the most uh, appropriate. Um, there may need to be some field verification, but um, I don't think we necessarily um, are considering a, a, a minimum size. I think that all um, wetlands would be considered for this. Is that correct, Juro? Um, you might have missed the question. I did. Uh, we're having a storm here and my electricity keeps going out. Um, so anyway, I'm sorry, I missed the question. Commissioner Najapa, do you want to repeat? Sure, thank you. I, I was asking about um, uh, appreciating first the, the, the inclusion of wetlands along with riparian areas, but wanting to understand, you know, wetlands uh, come in many different sizes and are defined differently based on, you know, EPA and other, you know, Clean Water Act um, and, and Waters of the United States um, legislation. And so uh, what definition are you using for wetland? Is there, is there a size guideline? Um, how do you define a wetland? So I think we would rely on the state of Colorado, which is, um, you know, in conjunction with uh, the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, which is sort of debating the scope of the Clean Water Act right now, but certainly in the past, m by far and away, most wetlands and ephemeral and intermittent streams um, have been and can be identified under that framework. I think Commissioner Nanjapa indicated no follow-up. Good. Very good. Other questions for this panel? All right, I'm seeing no further questions. Um, thank you both for your testimony and for presenting to us today. Um, we will allow this panel to uh, be moved away. And um, commissioners, our next panel is Commerce City with about 10 minutes. Do you want to continue and ta continue tackling that or take, take, our, take a break? Thumbs up, thumbs down, do you care? One more, let's keep going. Let's go to Commerce City and then we'll take a break after that. Thank you, Ms. Larson for the work you're doing here. See, Mr. Sura has joined us. Uh, do you have your witnesses available at this point, Mr. Sura? I, I do. Uh, we're going to be hearing from uh, Commerce City's environmental planner and local government designee, uh, Dominic Martinelli. Dominic? Thank you, Matt, for the introduction, and uh, thank you to the uh, members of the Colorado, Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission for taking the, the time to listen to our presentation today. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and start here and can everyone see my screen? We can. Okay, great. So I'm gonna go ahead and start here. Um, so one thing I do wanna note for this presentation, um, we're really gonna narrow it down to three major topics and items. Um, we submitted a pre-hearing statement as part of uh, the the uh, party status process. Um, I believe we get more into depth on a number of different items. Um, and this is somewhat of a small follow-up from the presentation that Matt Sura gave on my behalf on August 26th, but we really wanted to narrow in and focus on three main topics here. Um, the setbacks and the setback measurement as it pertains to the 600 series rulemakings, the relationship that it has with the alternative location analysis and the setback requirements, and then discuss variances. Um, I do wanna note, um, there are a lot of similarities here between the presentation that Adams County gave on Friday um, and the, the topics that we're going to be discussing today. There is a lot of similarity and overlap. Um, we're within the, the same jurisdiction and many of the concerns that they stated during that presentation we, we do also have. Um, but we want to kind of jump into it. So the city is supportive of the 1500 foot setback that was proposed from 10 or more building units or a high occupancy building unit. Um, and the city has actually gone as far as proposing similar language. Um, 
We're currently in the process of updating, updating our oil and gas regulations and have been taking a very close look at how the state is planning to move forward with theirs. Um, the one area that we do want to highlight and note, though, is that the city believes that a minimum setback of at least 1,000 feet should be placed in any circumstance, regardless of any homes or of how many homes are present. Um, we know that there's been a lot of presentation discussion on setbacks. Um, and as part of our pre-hearing statement, we did provide um, a list of studies that the city has reviewed in making its um, determinations and evaluations in terms of a minimum setback and feel that regardless of whether it's 10 units or if it's one unit or if it's five units or 100 units, that that minimum setback, there's there's still a lot of um, deliberation and, and science that needs to be discussed on the impacts of air quality and human health. Um, but from what we've re reviewed as far thus far is that at least a thousand feet should be in place. Um, the city also does commend the COGC for adopting the term working pad service and conducting setback measurements from that boundary. We do feel that is a significant improvement from where the previous rules are. Um, and we do have a kind of a little exhibit here to demonstrate the significance of that. And by increasing that definition, you're, you're in fact increasing the setback to a more protective and representative scenario that's actually on the ground. So the previous measurement of the edge of a permanent equipment facility um, to the edge of a building unit doesn't account for the, the drilling and completions phase of development and the production phase in terms of the, the extent of the boundaries where you might have truck traffic or um, additional operations that occur just beyond the boundary of the, the, low, the closest piece of permanent equipment on site. So taking a look at kind of that edge of the production site, um, as we call it in our, our draft regulations or as you define it as working pad surface um, is, is a significant improvement and we do wanna note that. Um, the one area that we really wanted to highlight in our presentation today is the relationship between the alternative location analysis and setbacks. Uh, the city does feel that in reviewing the draft regulations and the way that we, we looked at this and if our interpretation of this is incorrect, we can um, hopefully discuss that a little bit more. But based on the way that we re review the draft regulations is that an alternative location analysis would only be required if a facility is within 1500 feet. So requiring an alternative location analysis only when a proposed facility does not meet the minimum setback standards, it foregoes a vital opportunity to evaluate the best potential site to access mineral resources. So when we talk about alternative location analysis and really looking from a comprehensive development perspective and trying to figure out, um, and as Matt sort of alluded to a little bit in the previous presentation that he gave, Kind of taking the puzzle pieces and trying to figure out if you're looking at a municipality or in proximity to homes if you take we're looking at these sites and trying to figure out where might it be best to consolidate these facilities that are farther away from homes and reduce the overall cumulative impacts um, only requiring the alternative location analysis when a site is within 1500 feet of homes seems like a bit of a missed opportunity and there should be some consideration to increase um, the opportunities where you would require an alternative location analysis. And based on how we read it now, you would only be requiring one in the event that an operator is proposing a facility that doesn't meet the code. And then just a little bit more follow up with that, um, in our, our process, the regional operator agreement with an extraction of oil and gas, we did find the ALA process to be extremely useful and sorting that out and trying to find the sites that are most protective of public health, safety, welfare, and the environment, and simply even to implement proposed best management practices and that type of thing. So this, the commission should potentially consider adoption of an ALA in all circumstances or some value that's greater than the minimum setback requirement. So that could be 2,500 feet from a home or something along those lines where you have a gap between the minimum requirement and then some other value. So kind of a, a brief little example that we wanted to provide in terms of thinking about how you go through this process and just sort of site analysis as it relates to oil and gas operations. So you would think about kind of all the, the different features in an area where a potential site might be located, looking and seeing where schools are, where's a home, where's a park, where's there a sensitive wildlife area and start to map out buffers from those points. And then if an operator has to provide three potential locations, trying to figure out where logistically you could place a facility where there's the ability to put access and all those things. 
and start to look at that. And by not having this analysis, even when all proposed sites are exceeding 1500 feet from all those criteria, you're really missing out on the opportunity to select the most protective site um, since it's, there's no required analysis. So that's, that's another reason that um, we feel relatively strongly on that. Um, the, the final item that we wanted to talk about was variances. So this is an area that we wanted to discuss a little bit more in depth with the commissioners. Um, as it says, draft 604 C2 states that an exception can be granted to the setback rule if, if the commission finds after hearing pursuant to rule 510, the location can be approved because the commission has developed conditions of approval that protect the minimize adverse impacts to public health, safety, welfare, the environment and wildlife resources. Um, in our, in our reading of that, it seems that that criteria is the same as the approval criteria for a regular oil and gas location if it's meeting the minimum setback requirements. So as we, we think about that, and just in terms of clarity and um, making sure that operators, local governments and the state have a clear understanding um, as these go to uh, commission hearings, what specific approval criteria is needed to qualify for such an exemption. So giving clarity to the public, local governments, the industry, uh, what would be an acceptable waiver? And then some sort of consideration for um, the applicable local government's minimum standards in that requirement. So some language that we've included on variances in our draft regulations are the proposed reduction is the minimum needed for the regional development of mineral resources at the proposed location. So essentially saying that this request granted is the absolute minimum in terms of a, a reduction from that requirement. So if the minimum setback is 1500 feet, if that minimum is 1450, that's the absolute minimum to need to make, needed to make the site work, then that would be one of the criteria that's evaluated that they've gone through the alternative site analysis process and it determined that there's no other reasonable locations present to access the targeted minerals, and then an operator has incorporated any, initial, any necessary additional BMP practices beyond current requirements. So with that, those are the main three items that the city wanted to discuss in depth. Um, and myself and Matt Sir are available to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Mr. Martinelli, for that testimony. Thank you, Mr. Sir. Questions? Commissioner Nanjapa, then Commissioner McGowan. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you very much for that testimony. Um, I appreciated understanding a little bit more about what Commerce City is doing um, with your own regulations. Um, one question I had is you were kind of describing how you look at sort of the landscape and, and what various features are already out there. Um, do you also take into account existing oil and gas development that's within the area or does that factor in in any way to the, a new location? So that's something that, that does raise a good point. Um, in terms of looking at where the, the underground subsurface um, mineral resources are, um, kind of evaluating that, but also saying that if there is a facility that might be within 500 feet, but it might be a different operator, I know that there are some challenges of consolidating an existing facility with a new operator. Um, so those might be some challenges. So where, where it's reasonably um, and technically possible to do some sort of combination, that, that's something we would explore, but where there's not that ability, um, that, that isn't something that I think that we've discussed. Commissioner McGowan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thanks for your testimony today. I, I think I need some clarification on um, some of your recommendations so, to make sure I understand. Okay. Um, so are, are you recommending alternative location analysis for um, all circumstances? So even if um, the operator is um, within the setback that gets adopted outside of it, you still would like to see alternative location analysis? Yeah, I, I think that that's, that's, that's certainly the recommendation. And if you think about a scenario where they might be one mile away from any of those features defined, it's a very simple alternative location analysis. So at least saying that in all circumstances, taking a look at the, 
the surrounding conditions, the proximity of things, and trying to see where those facilities could be located. And then making sure that we have maybe some more clarity around what we would look for um, for a requested variance. Yes, that's correct. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Messner. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you for that testimony. I, I really appreciate the approach that Commerce City is taking on some of these topics, um, particularly with their own oil and gas regulations. I think they, uh, they're logical and make a lot of sense. I did have a couple of questions, though, um, around the waiver or the variance piece. Um, I guess my, my question is, what are your thoughts on having an independent uh, waiver process within Rule 604C2 versus utilizing the variance process uh, in 502. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit, but I think Matt Sura might want to weigh in additionally since he might be able to talk about some of the differences. But I think from just a very high level perspective, um, and we, we deal with this at a study level when we have our Board of Adjustment and our Planning Commission and our City Council, um, when we have some sort of requested deviation from the rules and regulations, um, even if it's a 510 um, hearing for you guys where it's the commission that's voting, um, we typically have some sort of list of set criteria that that typically meets um, from a staff analysis to say that there's six or seven criteria that would, would essentially be the approval criteria or the, the guidelines as to what, when a consideration for this type of deviation might be required. Um, if even if the commission goes through their hearing and it meets four out of the five or something along those lines, but they, they feel that it is justified in a request, the commission certainly could vote to um, approve that deviation, but basically just having the framework and the guidelines in process. Um, and I think it'll help your staff as well. So you're not getting a number of variance requests that you typically wouldn't consider or don't have some justified merit. Um, and Matt, is there any, anything else you wanted to weigh in there on the, the variance process? Just that uh, the variance process um, obviously has to shift um, and be an additional burden for uh, the, the company beyond just protecting protection of public health, safety, welfare, and the environment. Um, I think that the number of uh, entities have stated that they thought that the variance uh, language um, wasn't specific enough and, and wasn't a high enough burden to be able to waive uh, setbacks. And I, I would agree with that. You know, some of what is very specific to looking at alternative location analysis, you know, could be applied here. Um, you know, no alternative locations exist that um, maybe the oil and gas development will be as protective as if it were um, within the prescribed uh, setback. So, you know, there, there are some specific things that could be put into a waiver, but we wouldn't want to see a waiver that would be, um, you know, any less protective than, than the setback would in any instance. Sure, and I, I appreciate that. I think um, we did have some discussions uh, in the 500 series deliberations around, you know, what those standards or what those criteria may need to be in the variance process. And so, um, I guess as we move forward um, with this and try to put these different parts and pieces together, I'd be curious um, in the future on your thoughts versus, again, versus this topic, depending on ultimately what lands in the 502 uh, rule. So. Well, it's a, it's a really good point. And, you know, one of the reasons that I think that the variance process um, makes a lot of sense is that it is an additional hearing potentially. Um, an, an additional burden that the, the operator must meet and an, an additional, potentially an additional opportunity for uh, impacted landowners or impacted interests to participate in the Colorado Gas Conservation Commission process. Uh, certainly when you get into setbacks, you know, somebody within that setback um, who's going to be adversely affected you know, not only should be immediately granted standing, but there needs to be some outreach to um, those individuals, particularly in their disproportionately impacted communities, you know, and, and there may be, you know, instances in like that one where uh, no waiver or variance, you know, makes any sense at all. Um, 
just given the, the, the fact that, you know, their ability to be able to represent themselves before the Colorado Gas Conservation Commission and uh, the difficulty that, that that might pose for them. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Sura. Are there further questions for this panel? Okay, seeing none, uh, thank you both for your testimony. Uh, we will zoom you away. And I believe at this point, uh, we will take our morning break. Let's return at 1055, which is a little over 15 minutes. Good morning, commissioners. Welcome back. Um, we are in uh, our rulemaking and um, we are going to turn to the next parties. But before we do that, um, I want to uh, provide the mic to uh, Assistant Attorney General Davenport um, for a uh, notice to commissioners and staff. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, commissioners, it, we did have a party who attempted to submit substantive written comments to the entire commission through emails. And so I thought it was appropriate to revisit this briefly with you and the staff and, and the parties. Um, in regard to that communication, the commission did not request or otherwise solicit those emails. And the commission has not read the emails and will not consider their, their content as part of this rulemaking. Uh, over the past two weeks, the Commission has requested in open hearing that a few parties submit written comments to staff, but unsolicited substantive written comments to the entire Commission are not permitted by either the case management order or Rule 515. Rule 515 only allows parties to communicate with individual commissioners. And so in the future, uh, if a party wishes to speak to an individual commissioner, that party should send a request to speak to that commissioner with a general and brief description of the topic of that proposed discussion. Parties should not submit arguments, substantive comments, or documents with their request to speak. And it, we want everyone to be aware that you, the commissioners, do not have a legal obligation to respond to that request to speak. I'm happy to answer any questions at this point, but I think that hopefully provides some ground rules on communication with individual commissioners. And Thank you very much. Uh, does anyone have questions for for Attorney General Davenport. Okay, thank you, uh, Attorney General Davenport. Um, you. We appreciate that and appreciate you clarifying the record for our stakeholders. Um, at this time, Ms. Larson, we will move to the next party. I believe that is Colorado Rising. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning. You, how are you? Um, as you may know, Colorado Rising was the organization that brought the 2,500 foot ballot initiative in 2018. And we were prepared to bring it again this year, but for COVID-19. For the purposes of this rulemaking, we are advocating for a minimum 2,500 foot setback from the edge of a disturbed oil and gas location. Allow me to say that I am happy that on Friday, Commissioner McGowan noted that setbacks is more than just air quality. Not surprisingly, the industry wanted you to focus on that issue. Of course, they did not want to talk about the undeniable hard data showing that their accidents have resulted in explosions, gas leaks, and evacuation areas that are far more extensive than the proposed setback rules. They don't want to discuss the deaths caused by their accidents. That being said, on Friday morning, we saw a staff presentation showing a Google map located in Weld County and highlighting the setback distances found in the proposed rules. Mile High Stadium in the Pepsi Center were used as visual aids to understand the scope of the proposed setback rules. I was excited about the visual aid because I thought that the next responsible step the commission staff would take would be to offer a Google map of Broomfield, Thornton, or Commerce City where the home density is significantly greater than Weld County and then overlay the proposed setback distances with well-known oil and gas accidents showing blast zones, evacuation radii, and vapor dispersion. Maybe even have an overlay showing the radius of exposure of hydrogen sulfide based on the assumed 3,000 foot exposure found in proposed Rule 612B2. I mean, wouldn't it be helpful to have a Google map that shows the extent of risk to human life for one well 
which would then allow you to magnify the risk by more than 54,000 wells in Colorado. Such a map would serve as a reminder why we are here. The risk is huge. As an example, in December 2005, an explosion at a Barnett Shale gas well in Texas blew a 750 foot wide crater in the ground. Such a blast would level Mile High and the Pepsi Center. Let's not, let's not act like oil and gas accidents are foreign to Colorado. For example, there was an evacuation of a packed football stadium in Greeley during a high school football game due to a gas leak. How about the Windsor explosion on December 22nd, 2017, where 350 homes were within a mile of the site? How about the two mile radius evacuation in Sterling in May 2017? Or the one mile radi radi radius evacuation of Well County residents in November 2018? Or how about the dozen fires and explosions the Denver Post tallied in the first eight months since the fatal blast in Firestone? Have we forgotten about the Platteville explosion earlier this year? Commissioners, we do know that when you overlay these current proposed rules with actual accidents, particularly in communities with far more populated areas in Weld County, it demonstrates the paucity of these proposed setback rules. Here's the thing, you have all the data about accidents, explosions, deaths, ex evacuations, and vapor dispersion. You have them at your fingertips. You have the number of complaints from Broomfield residents just this year alone about noise, odor, and adverse health effects associated with fracking. So why the less protective proposed rules? On Friday morning, we saw a presentation from the AG's office on the Chevron case that discusses deference to administrative agencies. What we'll balance out difference is the requirement that administrative agencies actually operate within their statutory mandates. I anticipate that these proposed rules will not be afforded deference as they are across purposes with Senate Bill 19181. And it's not difficult for me to prove my point. The director's objective criteria was supposedly grounded in pub protecting public health, safety, welfare, the environment and wildlife resources. The criteria established a review of permits based on setback distances that are far more protective than, those, than these proposed rules. The measurement is from the edge of disturbed oil and gas location, which also is far more extensive than the proposed rule. The measurement was then expanded again in October 2019 with the release of the CDPHE study. The criteria placed as priority a review of permits under 2,000 feet. The press announcement surrounding the CDPHE study indicated that, quote, the data learned from the new testing will inform COGCC's new regulation and rulemakings, and to ensure protective protocols are part of SB 19181's rulemaking outcomes, end quote. So it came as a surprise that instead of the proposed setback rules being as protective or more protective than the criteria, the commission opted to go in the opposite direction to be as least protective as possible. I get there are a lot of studies from all sides that support greater or lesser setbacks, but Senate Bill 19181 wasn't passed for you to engage in some sort of tie break. Senate Bill 19181's protective lens is by which this commission is supposed to operate. The commission is to adopt the precautionary principle that it is better to be safer than sorry. I mean, the commission does know how to be safer when it adopted Rule 612, which assumes a radius exposure of 3,000 feet for hydrogen sulfide. Commissioners taken as a whole, a minimum 2,500 foot setback distance from the disturbed oil and gas area is the supported distance to best protect the public health, safety, welfare, environment, and wildlife resources. I'm ha happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Mr. Salazar. Um, I do have a quick follow-up question for you. So you mentioned um, that you would like the measurement to occur from the edge of the well pad surface. Uh, what about the other side? Uh, do you want the measurement to the building unit or to the property line, or do you have an opinion? It would be from the property line, definitely the property line. I think that uh, that the your uh, when you were director, your objective criteria. I think that the, that measurement, as you indicated in your um, in your memo, uh, best protects the public health, safety, welfare, and the environment. And I think that that's what the commission needs to do is 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 to follow the at least that measurement guideline. Thank you for that. Questions? Uh, Commissioner McGowan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thanks for your testimony today. Um, I'm wondering, um, the 2500 setback, are you basing that on the CDPHE study or um, did you all look at something specific that leads you to believe the 2500 setback is uh, protective? Yeah, so what we did is we took a look at not only the CDPHE uh, study, but we also took a look at uh, throughout the nation as well as here in Colorado, uh, the number of accidents that have occurred. 
Um, as I indicated a little while ago, um, we looked at uh, what, hap what has happened in Texas as well as in other areas. Now, here's the thing is that the oil and gas industry actually has the setback study that was conducted in 2017, and we've provided it to the commission, and you, you have that. In that study, it actually looked at um, the number of setbacks in Colorado, in Texas, and then there was one other state. I can't remember it offhand. And they looked at that setback, uh, or the, the various setbacks in those states, and then they compared it with the accidents and the explosions, the vapor dispersion and things of that nature. And they said that Colorado's setback distances are woeful. Um, they didn't provide an actual uh, you know, foot uh, measurement in terms of what setbacks should be. But when we've taken a look at all the data and we've taken a look at air quality studies, the accidents and, and what have you, uh, that's how we landed on the 2,500 foot setback distance. Now we've heard from the various outdoor industry uh, uh, organizations that have testified here, and they've actually asked for something much bigger than 2,500 feet. They've asked for a half mile setback, and we would definitely support that. But but here's the thing: is that th as you indicated, uh, Commissioner McGowan, this isn't just about air quality, and this isn't about a, a, the battle of the experts. This is about when you take a look at it as a whole, as we say in the law, the totality of the circumstances, you have to agree, or at least I think that you would come to a conclusion that at the very minimum, 2,500 feet is the protective minimum safe distance for public health, safety, welfare, and the environment. And, and also, if, if you don't mind me saying this, this, this whole discussion of variances it really disturbs me so much because a variance, as the, the, the last uh, group testified, a variance is a request to not obey the law, right? It, is, it, it allows you to actually go the opposite direction. And, um, and that shouldn't be part of this discussion here. There shouldn't be a discussion about variances um, at all because you're not empowered to allow people to not obey Senate Bill 19181. That, that has been taken from you. And, uh, and so I just wanted to put that out there because I hope that you consider that carefully in your deliberations that, you know, do you have the power to allow for variances to occur? So Mr. Salazar, um, I do believe that the leadership that drafted 181 testified at the beginning of the hearing that they specifically did not put in a specific setback and that that's for this commission to determine. Um, I believe the commission has within its authority, if it believes it's the right place to land, to not only determine a setback, but also determine a time when that setback could be uh, waived or varied, et cetera. I do not think that's against the law. But having said that, I just want to make sure that I'm clear that your, your position is that we ought not have a, a, a variance or a waiver to a setback, that we should establish a setback and then apply it at all times. Is that right? Yes, and, and so I, I listened to the legislator's testimony, and I appreciate the fact that they didn't put in, a, you know, that they didn't legislatively mandate a certain setback distance. And, and you know, certainly, had I been a legislator, I would not have proposed a setback distance. That is for for you all to decide, right? Um, and so uh, that's what's resulted in today's and Friday's hearing is is to discuss this issue. But on the issue of variances, yeah, that that issue was left silent. Uh, uh, Chair Robbins, it was silent. Uh, however, you always have to go back to the uh, the actual mandate, uh, the statutory mandate of the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Act, as amended by Senate Bill 19181, and that mandate is to protect the public health, safety, and welfare, environment, and wildlife resources, uh, first and foremost, before any oil and gas interest. And you know, there's that as well as other statutory changes that were made by one, uh, 181 that tell me that you weren't granted the ability to make things less protective. That if you actually establish your rules because your rules are quote, the most protective for public health, safety, welfare and the environment, that you then cannot go backwards from that and say, well, now we can make it less protective because of variances. It's kind of like how uh, some of the counties are arguing that yeah, sure, go ahead and establish your state floor to protect the public but then we're gonna go and dig a basement uh, below that state floor. And you all are saying to them, you can't dig that basement because we've established a, a protective measure for the state of Colorado. And now you're doing exactly, well, at least the deliberation is telling me that you're considering doing exactly what these, these, uh, these counties 
have been arguing is that you can establish a floor and then you could dig below it and, and establish a basement through these variances. And I just don't think that that's correct. Okay, thank you for that testimony. Are there further questions for Mr. Salazar? All right, seeing none, thank you again for participating with us and presenting your view. Appreciate that on behalf of Colorado Rising. Um, we now will move thank to you. our next panel. Um, Ms. Larson, is that La Plata County, San Miguel County, Picking County, that group? Yes, that's correct. Ms. Rogers with us. I believe that we're looking. There she is. Okay. She's coming on. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Maki Iatridis. I represent La Plata and San Miguel counties. Our sole witness for the 600 series will be La Plata County Attorney Cheryl Rogers. We'll start today with Rule 608. Uh, current Rule 608 provides for the collection of monitoring data to verify that water wells, ground, and surface waters in residence of CBM producing basins are adequately protected against methane impacts from shallow CBM development. These processes were originally applied in our basin in 2000 through COGCC orders and then adopted as current Rule 608. With the 2020 rulemaking process, a single rule has now been split into Rules 614 and 15. However, the content currently set forth in Rule 608C has been deleted. Rule 608C relates to coal outcrops. This rule is specific to our basin and the county and members of industry in our area agree about the need to maintain it. We are not aware of any consultations that occurred about its removal and we ask that it be reinserted rather than relying on 20 year old orders where compliance may depend on the existence of institutional knowledge and the requirements are not readily accessible or transparent. We see harm by the omission of the language, but if the commission is unwilling to reinsert it, the existence of the order should be referenced in the rules. As to rule 604, it is beyond debate that it provides less protection of smaller populations and without any oversight by this commission, whose duty it is to protect, allows rural property owners who are unaware of the scientific data and risk discussed today to bargain away protections of their health and the health of all others who will subsequently live in their home. We ask the commission to correct these disparities. Overall, the SBP justifies the need for greater setbacks based on acute health risk thresholds and the need to dissipate noise, odors, glare, and light. However, each of these justifications exist regardless if one lives in a home surrounded by two residences or 20. CDPHE's human health risk assessment found unacceptable acute health risk due to chemicals at all model distances between 300 feet and 2,000 feet from oil and gas facilities. In the study and in Dr. Richardson's testimony, we saw no data or information that indicated those in less populated areas are somehow more immune to these health risks. In addition, the commission has heard testimony about the impacts of noise, odors, glare, and light on humans. While we have heard some distinctions between rural and urban areas when measuring the baseline of such impacts, there's been no persuasive evidence that demonstrates that those in sparsely populated areas are less susceptible to the adverse impacts of nuisance conditions. In fact, some testimony has shown the opposite. Given this lack of data-driven justification, our fear is twofold. Part of the justification seems to be the desire to push development to less populated areas. If this is correct, urban areas are protected, consistent with the new mission, but more rural areas are expected to still foster development. Our second fear is residents in our county and San Miguel will be subjected to health risks and nuisance conditions not required of others due to cost. For example, last week's staff justified the disparity not on health-based factors, but because it is easier to mitigate around a small number of residences. However, one of the most fundamental changes of Senate Bill 181 is protection of public health, safety, and welfare without regard to cost. As such, the cost of protecting a smaller population cannot be justification for the disparity. La Plata and San Miguel do not have the technical expertise to define for the commission what the appropriate setback distances should be. 
However, we can tell you that our citizens, their health, and their rights to live free of overly intrusive nuisances are equally important to the protections provided to other Colorado citizens. You commissioners have an important risk management policy to make. It is a challenging decision for many reasons. As you've heard, one of the more critical reasons is that there are important data gaps. The risk assessment discussed by Dr. Richardson is a major step forward in providing more data, but as Dr. Richardson acknowledged, the risk assessment did not assess many things. It did not assess the cumulative long-term health effects in areas that have multiple well pads. The toxicology data does not have all the outcomes that people may be concerned with, such as headaches or itchy eyes. The data does not address risks that occur in less than an hour, which is where COGCC gets the most frequent complaints. And the risk assessment has not measured or quantified other chemicals, the effects of mixtures of chemicals, or the cumulative effects of exposure to all impacts such as noise, odor, vibrations, or traffic. We believe there is an incorrect view that the CDPHE risk assessment is overly conservative and overstates the real risk. When it comes to benzene and short-term risk, the risk assessment is conservative, but Dr. Richardson stated clearly that there is much still to learn about the risks and impacts of oil and gas operations. Thus, in the face of uncertainty, how does this commission establish a setback policy? Senate Bill 181 provides a new tool that was not available to the COGCC before. As noted by Senator Foote when the bill was debated, it is the precautionary principle. The essence of the precautionary principle is if one is not sure what may happen, caution is the proper course of action. As such, this principle allows you to be more protective than the data may show at this time. We encourage you to apply this principle to Rule 604 setbacks. We respectfully ask you to provide equal protection to all Colorado citizens. That concludes our testimony. Thank you, Ms. Rogers, um, for that testimony. Uh, appreciate your community and San Miguel's participation with us and for bringing to the fore some of the more rural concerns that you bring, as well as some of the concerns from your developed field. Um, I will have the uh, Assistant Attorney General Minor speak to the um, issue that you raised about the deletion in um, 608 see at, uh, at the appropriate time, but I appreciate you bringing that to our attention. Um, is it your testimony that um, the protections then are still within the orders that were entered in the early 2000s, um, but that it's more transparent for it to be in the rule and that's why La Plata County would like to see it reinserted? Yes, the rules are uh, difficult to locate and you have to know of their existence um, to find them and we uh, believe that it's a lot um, more user friendly uh, to the community and uh, industry if those are there. And we also recently lost our oil and gas planner. We have only one. And when that person uh, leaves, it can be really difficult to maintain the knowledge. And oftentimes that person, the knowledge goes with them when they walk out the door. So um, we would very much just like it to be in there and, um, and, and clear and transparent for everybody. Great, thank you. Uh, we will look into that with staff. Uh, are there further questions for this panel? Very good, I'm not seeing any, which mean we hear you and heard you well and you did a good job, so appreciate that. Uh, thank you for your testimony this morning. Um, we appreciate your participation. Uh, with that, we will uh, turn to Ms. Larson. Is it Weld Air and Water Group? Yes. Good morning, commissioners and staff. Uh, my name is Sarah Matsumoto. I will be presenting on behalf of Weld Air and Water. Um, and it's just me this morning. Welcome. Are you Glad able to, you. to, do you hear me okay? We can hear you just fine, okay. yes. Wonderful. Um, let me just get my screen shared. Sorry, one moment. It's a little delayed getting my screen share up.
Uh, I apologize. Uh, I had a couple slides just with some summary points. Um, I'd be happy to send those, but um, I'm just, for some reason, my computer is giving me an error message. So I'm going to go ahead and just in the interest of time, talk through a couple points for you. Um, as you know, I represent community groups and individuals in Weld County who've been impacted by oil and gas development. Um, I just want to thank you all so much for your continued engagement um, with the parties, with all the stakeholders. And I want to briefly address a, just a couple areas in the August 17th draft of the 600 series rules. Um, the first is setbacks. Obviously, that's um, been a pretty hot topic over the last few days throughout this rule series. Um, and our clients, like many of the other community groups and environmental groups, uh, recommend a 2,500 foot setback from residential buildings measured from the edge of the well pad, and then a slightly increased setback uh, applied to schools and child care centers of 2,640 feet or roughly half a mile. Um, we've submitted with our pre-hearing statements kind of a compendium of some health studies. Uh, I know other parties have submitted um, some of those same exhibits. And we just encourage you to read those. I'm sure you have already, um, but there's just a wealth of information there as well as information collected here in Colorado that I know we all heard about last week um, that we think really justify those increased setbacks. And in particular, with the, respect to the question of why we might have a, a greater setback for schools and child care centers, um, I appreciate the, the presentation of the Colorado Rising Group who talked about, you know, that it, it isn't just air quality. And I think this gets to Commissioner McGowan, McGowan's point as well. Um, kids are just kind of different. You know, their respiratory systems are still developing, but there are increased safety concerns. They're still learning not to necessarily run out into the streets. And so when you have uh, increased truck traffic um, and small kids chasing balls around or playing on ball fields, um, there's just an increased risk of safety concerns overall. So that's uh, one reason why we might apply a little bit greater distance for schools and child care centers. Additionally, we encourage you um, to amend the rules and consider making setbacks, the increased setbacks applicable to all types of building units um, or all residential building units, I should say, not just those that are higher density. Um, I agree with, with the panel before me that um, folks living in rural areas shouldn't be sort of um, discriminated against by this rule and perhaps they experience impacts um, in, a, in a more significant or in a greater way than we might expect. Um, and lastly, I want to turn to rule 16 uh, looking at groundwater sampling. Um, I just have two brief points with respect to groundwater monitoring and sampling. The first is um, we encourage you to make sure that the rules are clear that the director is still able to exercise his or her discretion pursuant to rule 901 to potentially instruct the operator to install more than four monitoring wells if um, that's what's needed to protect public health, safety, and welfare. Currently, there's a little bit of a limit um, of up to four wells just in the standard rule 615B. Um, and I know there is some uh, disclaimer language in 615A about the discre director's discretion. I think it would be helpful if it was just clarified um, that the director's discretion includes potentially the ability to exceed that limit. Um, and another situation where I think it would be important to be able to potentially exceed the limit of four monitoring wells would be uh, what's described in Rule 615B4, where there are multiple identified aquifers. Um, if an operator is required to sample both a deep and a shallow aquifer, I think it might make sense to um, have, you know, potentially four wells per aquifer rather than a total of four so that you can really try to capture kind of the up gradient and down gradient flow at more than one uh, just potent potential point where the aquifer and any associated pollution would be traveling. Um, that concludes my presentation. Again, I'd be happy to share the PowerPoint um, with Ms. Larson when I'm able to access it, and I'm also happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you um, for that testimony. And yes, if you're able to get that over to Ms. Larson, that would be great. We ask all parties to do that. It helps us in deliberation. Are questions for this witness? All right, um, not seeing any, we appreciate your testimony. I appreciate your participation in our process. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Larson, um, I think you, um, can you inform us who's next? Yes, I'd be happy to, Mr. Chair. Um, TEP will not be presenting today. So next up we have Aaron Martinez. Great.
see that we have Ms. Martinez has joined us. Um, Ms. Martinez, you're still muted. Can you hear me now? We can, um, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Erin Martinez, and I am a survivor of the Firestone home explosion. Not a single day goes by that we do not relive this nightmare and wish so badly that we could go back and make the changes to keep this horrific tragedy from happening. Everyone in this room moving forward does have the power to make the changes to keep keep this nightmare from happening to someone else. In 2017, my house was lifted off its foundation by an explosion caused by the accumulation of gas in our basement from a leaking improperly abandoned flow line. My son and I survived, but my husband Mark and brother Joey did not make it out alive. We miss them more with each passing day and most days struggle to breathe. I come to you today to speak about change in their honor. I have a lot of strong opinions on changes needed in the industry, but I try to only speak about the changes needed to keep my story from becoming someone else's reality. I feel a strong sense of duty to Mark and Joey to make sure that we continue to make change. Since the explosion three and a half years ago, I think we have started on a path of great change in the industry and making safety our top priority. I thank everyone who has contributed. However, we still have a long way to go. Several degrees of negligence led to the explosion, which in turn calls for the need of immediate change. The improperly abandoned flow line was never disconnected nor capped at the well, and pressure checks were not performed. Hopefully, by removing abandoned lines clo close to new development and new safety regulations, future similar tragedies can be avoided. However, I still think even with all the changes made to flow line safety, leaks are still going to happen. The only way to keep these leaks from being catastrophic is to move them away from where we work and live. This can only be accomplished through setbacks. I strongly believe that it does not do us any good to move the wells away if we are going to allow the rest of the infrastructure to stay where it is. The line that leaked gas into my basement was only six feet from my back door. If the well had been moved 2,000 feet away from my home, but the flow line was still left six feet away, the explosion would still have occurred, regardless of the well setback. We need to move all infrastructure away from our homes in order to make us truly safe. That is why I would like to see infrastructure associated with these wells, flow lines in particular, included in the setbacks. The setback distance for flow lines could mirror the setback distance for wells, or it could be set at a greater or lesser distance, so long as it adequately protects public health, safety, and welfare of the environment. In arriving at a distance, I urge the commission to take into account dissipation rates of gas, variation in soil types that might facilitate the movement of gas, and other factors that could influence potential threats to the public. I feel this measure is necessary to safeguard the public from the possibility that gas leaking from a flow line could gather in buildings or result in another explosion. While I applaud the staff's proposal to adapt setbacks addressing public safety, I urge the commission to also address threats from the oil or gas that they produce. Not only did gas collect in my basement from the leaking flow line, several pockets of gas were discovered throughout the neighborhood. Some of these pockets never made their way into a dwelling because simply put, it was far enough away. Had the flow line by my house been further from my back door, the gas would have never collected in my basement and Mark and Jay would still be with us. I urge you to consider adding infrastructure to the proposed setback rules in their honor. Another degree of negligence, in my opinion, was building my home 178 feet from the well, which I realized was the decision of the town and the developer. I know the well was there first, but development should never be allowed to be that close. If we continue to push industry and our daily lives in close proximation, similar tragedies will continue to occur. I struggle every day with, why did this happen to us? Why our home? Why my husband? Why my brother? And sometimes the only thing that can bring me peace is that it could have been so much worse. Would have ha what would have happened if that improperly abandoned line was next to a school filled with hundreds of our children? I can't even imagine. We need to do everything we can to keep that from happening. Not only do we need setbacks for new wells, but we also need setbacks for new construction next to old wells. In my opinion, these wells are much more dangerous and we need to consider them too. 
When building new homes next to existing oil and gas infrastructure, it is almost impossible to keep the two from intertwining. Our home was built where tank batteries used to reside, and the lines connecting the tank batteries and well were still on our property, even the improperly abandoned ones. Had there been a setback to building new homes next to existing oil and gas infrastructure, this tragedy could have been avoided. I understand that regulation of new development next to existing oil and gas is not your authority, but just because it isn't your job, so to speak, doesn't mean that we should ignore it. Setbacks are needed for all oil and gas infrastructure, both for new wells and existing wells. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Martinez, for uh, being with us and, and testifying today. Um, I appreciate your acknowledging that uh, the commission regulates oil and gas and, and doesn't regulate uh, new home development near old oil and gas that may be nearby. Um, I, for one, will pledge that, you know, in our new um, work with local governments, which we are tasked with doing, um, I want to make sure that we bring the expertise of the commission to local governments across the state so that we can help local governments as they are involved in regulating development near historic oil and gas wells. I think that uh, we have the scientists and the capability to help local governments in those lines. So just wanted to make that statement to you about that, that last point that you made. Are there questions from commissioners for Ms. Martinez? Okay, great. Ms. Martinez, I'm not seeing any questions. Again, we really thank you for your testimony and participating in this. Uh, you have been a robust participant in the COGCC rulemakings after 181, and I, for one, am very thankful for your participation. I think it really has made a difference. Thank you. Okay, uh, Ms. Larson, we will continue down our uh, panels. Um, and I believe that we have the Small Operator Society up next. That is correct. And Mr. Jason Moore is also presenting on behalf of the Small Operator Society. I don't see him in the list. Mr. Moore, if you're currently in the Zoom meeting, if you could raise your hand. Mr. Rick McRicker, do you know if Mr. Moore was planning on attending today? Uh, yes, he was. Mr. McRicker, maybe you could text Mr. Moore and see if he's with us. I'm doing that currently. I figured as much. Thanks. Um, I'm not quite sure where he's at. Uh, he was going to make a brief introduction, um, but I would be happy to start if you would like. And, and Mr. Moore, actually, uh, we just found him, so he is now a panelist. Okay, thank you. Good morning, Mr. Moore. Good morning. I, I apologize for that. I was on the Zoom and raising my hand, but nobody could see me. So uh, apologies uh, for that, uh, the, the, the days of Zoom. Um, well, thank you, Chairman Robbins, uh, and good morning, Commissioners. Jason Moore, Counsel for the Small Operator Society. With me today, as you know, I think is Chris McRickard with URSA Operating Company, one of our small operators. Uh, we're here today to talk about uh, 604 setbacks. 
Uh, Chris is going to spend some time this morning addressing how our group of small operators generally approaches siting decisions. He's going to talk about some of the constraints that our operators face, uh, particularly on the west slope, uh, where, for example, uh, it's just not feasible to drill the three-mile horizontal wells that you heard about earlier this morning. Uh, and then finally, Chris is going to talk about um, the fact that larger prescriptive setbacks um, uh, can often remove the flexibility that's needed to find the right siting decision and uh, that we feel uh, it's a better approach to let the ALA and local government siting processes play out. So with that introduction, I'll turn it over to Chris. Good morning. Uh, my name is Chris McRickard. I'm the regulatory manager for URSA Operating Company, a small operator on the western slope of Colorado. Over the last 10 years, I have worked in the DJ and Piance basins in both rural and urban settings. I'm here today on behalf of the Small Operator Society, a group of 59 independent oil and gas producers with operations in the Eastern Plains, the Front Range, and the Western Slope of Colorado. I'm here today to comment on setbacks proposed in 600 series. The Small Operator Society believes we can operate in a manner that is protective of public health, safety, welfare, the environment, and wildlife resources, leveraging best management practices and conditions of approval. We strongly support the commission to defer the siting of an oil and gas location to the relevant local government with land use authority and refrain from imposing unsupported and restrictive setbacks as proposed in rule 604 and by some other parties. We support early engagement of the commission with relevant local government siting process which are required to meet or exceed commission rules. The statement of basis and purpose acknowledges that oil and gas locations are independently unique. Flexibility for the site specific considerations is needed for operators, local, state, and federal agencies when siting the most protective location. When planning an oil and gas location, operators do focus on how we can be protective of the public health, safety, welfare, the environment, and wildlife resources by adhering to the commission's rules, relevant local government rules, and federal regulations. During the planning process, we look to avoid sensitive locations as much as possible while considering our technical ability to access our minerals including analyzing one or more locations. The underlying geology determines how the minerals will be developed. Vertical and directional wells have limitations as to how far they can extend below the ground. While horizontal wells are efficient where the geology allows these wells to be drilled. Existing 300 and 600 series rules provide ample notice comment periods and interaction with surface owners, building unit owners, relevant local governments, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, and CDPHE, which ensure that stakeholder engagement takes place and concerns are sufficiently addressed. The existing rules, excuse me, the existing 604 rules leverage exception zone and buffer zone setbacks of 500 and 1,000 feet respectively for urban mitigation areas, high occupancy building units, schools, child care facilities, and designated outdoor activity areas. These zones are protective in combination with conditions of approval and best management practices. In our view, the current framework works well and provides the flexibility to address various concerns by stakeholders. The fact is that operators often face a variety of constraints as to where we can locate our facilities. For example, while surface rights are subservient to the dominant mineral estate, competing surface development in urban areas constrains viable surface locations for operators to access their minerals. For small operators limited by, their, by the size of their leasehold, surface locations may be even more finite compared to larger operators with ample leasehold acreage. In rural areas, Comprehensive wildlife restrictions, agriculture, topography, and water resources are thematic constraints as well. In addition, surface owners often dictate where they want 
production facilities to be sited on their property as agreed upon in the surface use agreement. You heard previously from several independent experts that toxicology data does not support setbacks as large as 2,000 feet. Larger setbacks will exacerbate surface restrictions for smaller operators. Existing commission setbacks are protective and restrict where oil and gas locations can be sited. But at least the current framework allows some flexibility to address these constraints and accommodate various stakeholders' concerns. Commission staff cited that Form 2A applications within 1,000 feet have seen a significant decrease from 25% in 2014 to 10% in 2019. Within 500 feet, Form 2A applications in 2014 constituted 5%, while in 2019 that dropped to 1% to 2%. This demonstrates that existing setback rules are working and that operators are responding to where oil and gas locations are sited. In addition to these successes, the extensive amount of proposed plans to be submitted with a Form 2A address many nuisance concerns. These plans must address spill response for public water systems, noise, light, odor, dust, traffic, process safety management, emergency response, flooding, H2S, waste management, gas capture, leak detection, topsoil protection, stormwater management, interim reclamation, wildlife protection, water usage, and cumulative impacts. The breadth of these site-specific plans, along with staff's review process, substantiate larger setbacks are not needed beyond the existing protective setbacks, state setbacks. In addition to all of these protective plans, the 300 series rules also provide an alternative location analysis when criteria is triggered. Greater communication between the commission and local governments in citing decisions will also be more protective. Rather than prescribe setbacks in the 600 series, we suggest that the commission allow the OGDP, ALA, and local government citing process work to ensure that the best citing decisions are made while addressing the concerns from all relevant stakeholders. This concludes my comments. Thank you for those comments and that testimony. Are there questions from commissioners? Commissioner Messner. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the testimony. Um, so, Mr. McRickard, I assume based on where you're located that um, some percentage of, uh, of your lease holdings are on federal land. Is that correct? That is correct. So, and so some of the testimony we've heard is uh, asking uh, this commission to um, provide substantially similar regulations around riparian habitats uh, as is required by the BLM uh, as far as their review of oil and gas sites, understanding that you're probably um, required to meet some of those um, federal standards. Um, what are your thoughts on the state having similar standards? Um, as far as BLM lands, we would look to avoid um, you know, entering riparian areas. And then on non-federal lands, uh, it would be likely that we would um, not want to locate a pad location near or in a riparian area uh, because of stability of the ground. So it wouldn't be an ideal place um, to have a location. So you'd be supportive of of those then? Within reason. Okay. Commissioner Mesner, this is Jason Moore. May I add a little flavor to that? Sure. I mean, I was asking uh, Mr. McRickard specifically, but you can, yeah. I, I think one of our concerns, that's sort of a late-breaking proposal, and it's very difficult to evaluate 
how um, a setback from a riparian area would work without knowing exactly where those areas are, how big. Um, and I, I don't think that evaluation has taken place until we have all of the information. It's sort of similar to a lot of the other 1200 series uh, rules and just making sure that we have the data to even be able to evaluate uh, what a specific requirement would look like. So I think right now we're not in a position to uh, to say that we would agree with a riparian setback because frankly, I don't think we know where those are and what the impacts would be. You, you do acknowledge though that the federal process does have those standards uh, as far as setbacks from riparian areas and do have a process to evaluate that, correct? Correct. All right, thank you. Other questions for this panel? All right, I am not seeing other questions. So we thank this panel for their presentation and for their participation. And we will allow this panel to uh, be removed. Um, Ms. Larson, um, we are at uh, 1146, and I know that um, the schedule has the next panel, which is Weld County, at 1 o'clock. Do you know whether there's a preference for them to go at 1 or what? Yes, if we could start up at 1 o'clock, I think that would be preferable for everyone. Okay. Um, seeing that uh, that would be preferable for Weld County, we will allow for that to happen. We will take our lunch break now and commissioners, we will return at one o'clock.